<laughs> Sorry for getting the meeting started about 12 minutes late. Before we get going, I just want to read this announcement that in accordance with the open meeting law, <laughs> the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> right. Anybody here for public comment? We have our wonderful partners from RMLD here this evening to kick things off. So we'd like to turn it over to you if you wouldn't mind. And uh, you can sit right there. And we'll do it Wherever you're most comfortable. You want to you go up there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. And if you just wouldn't mind stating your name and information for the folks listening at home. much for having us tonight from Reading Light. Colleen O'Brien, the general manager, and with me is the director of engineering and operations, Amit Jafari, uh, is here as well in case anyone has any questions. Uh, I know you have a very full agenda, so I'll um, try to go as quickly as possible and try to give you an update uh, over the last year. Um, basically, we use the template that's used for the town meeting in Reading, um, and we provide each of the towns pretty much the same information tailored for them twice a year. So this is, um, this is your update for the first quarter. One of the things we did differently this year, uh, aside from our third grade educational program, which talks to the children uh, throughout all of our service territory on energy conservation, shredding the peak, as well as uh, safety, is we had a summer program where we had the high school come in. I'm uh, not sure if you remember the last few years, uh, some drawings that my children had done uh, to when we changed to paperless. And we kind of changed our uh, annual report to something that was homegrown and done in-house to save money uh, and to be able to put our own, um, you, know, you know, talent to it. Uh, the first one was about shaving the peak. The second one was uh, showed a picture. Um, skateboarding, shred the peak. So I said, why not have a high school? Why not have them come in and we'll make the first place winner the cover of our um, annual report. So this year, uh, it was Electricity was the name of it, and it was Laura Buscemi from North Reading High School. She was the one that won. So it was pretty amazing at the Reading town meeting because the picture was the size of the auditorium, so it was very cool. She was there with her family. The second place was uh, Reading Megan Corum. Uh, this uh, demonstrated shredding the peak between two and seven. Uh, and this one donned the back of our t-shirts for our annual Public Power Open House, which is in October with the kids with the bucket truck rides and all of the different things that everyone can learn all ages. Uh, third place was Sophia Bonascorsi from Wilmington High School. And uh, it just thought it did a very well job of depicting how friendly we are and courteous and how quick we get to your house. So um, she did a great job with the artwork. Uh, the fourth place was Patrick Asella from Reading. Uh, and this one was really cute. Um, he says, uh, what would you like today, Mr. Peak? And he says, well, a little off the, off the top, please. And it was shaved Peak. So. so we had fun. And they got uh, 10 hours of community service for coming in. Uh, and I think we'll continue the program. So on to our statistics, uh, I usually show you this slide every year. It just goes through um, 
you know, the peak demand in retail sales for people that are, uh, you know, wondering how many new services and things of that nature. But um, Mike will have the, um, the slide presentation and, you know, we can go back to those if you have any questions. But it's just our basic statistics. So some of the highlights that I thought were worth going over, clean audit with no management letter. Anyone that goes through those know that a nice clean one with no management letter is the best. Uh, 2.5 megawatt natural gas power distribution. Dis sorry. Oh, that's OK. The screen's Turn pointing this. in the wrong direction. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Distributed generator that was installed at the North Reading uh, to shred the peak. Um, that got installed and, and went live uh, in July. Uh, we, we've been running it, uh, well, during that cold snap a week or so ago, we ran it every single day. So uh, that is helping to offset the cost of um, peak priced electricity, which not only is it very costly, but it also is the time when the more polluting generators are asked to turn on. So there's a lot of benefits to being able to, um, to run that. Our Solar Choice Community Solar Program, we now have uh, one full subscription in Wilmington, 500 customers. The second project, uh, we're looking at 660 customers, and I think as of Friday we had 560, so we have a few more spaces. They fill up pretty quick. That's 45th and Fordham Road in Wilmington, and then there's another four megawatt coming on in Wilmington as well, and we're looking at carving off one of those megawatts for our community solar. Um, we're working with those, uh, with those vendors and, and coming up with the finan financials on that program. If you are interested, as I've said in the, in the past, of uh, any type of rooftop unit or whatever, we'd be glad to collaborate with the town and, and, and take a look at that. Um, one of the reasons why we look at um, generating power within our service territory is capacity is such an expensive component of, of, uh, of the bill. And if the capacity is actually being generated in the service territory, you don't have to pay that. So again, another benefit. Um, we did do our triannual cost of service study this year. Um, Shred the Peak campaign. I spoke about the high school art contest. Uh, we've redone our rebates. Every year we do an analysis and change up our rebates. And we now have a new online rebate portal. So you can do online uh, to fill out your rebate forms and it's all so you don't have to deal with paper. Uh, efficiency and peak reduction measures. This is just a kind of a list of the things that we offer that people like to see, commercial energy initiatives, lighting rebates, electrical vehicle charging rebate program we have now. Uh, if you want to try to get one for your home, we're actually installing one in each town through, a, through the Volkswagen grant. We're going to start with one at the RMLD this, this spring. Uh, we held a lunch and learn um, for commercial, industrial, and municipal customers for the peak reduction program, which we already talked about, um, the benefits there. Residential energy assessments, please don't hesitate to call us. We're, we're, uh, we have a great program to go out and evaluate your home. Um, talked about the rebate portal. Let's see. Like that. That, that. Okay, let's go. Okay, solar choice again. Uh, this is just goes over it. We're probably going to be um, changing it up a little bit because we did so well uh, on the first couple of projects. So Jane and the Integrated Resources de Department right now are, are going through the rate analysis to see if we can't even lower the cost further from the monthly charge of $5. Economic development. Um, a lot of the towns are always looking for how can I attract more um, to my area. This is a slide that basically we used, um, we used it in Wilmington to attract uh, Osram, Sylvania to come in. They had five other choices of where to move. So it works really well if economic development, um, I mean, if you want to help feed the golden egg of RMLD and keep the rates low, um, or, you know, or if you, um, you know, are looking to uh, increase your development. Proactive maintenance programs that we went over them last year, they, they're going very well. We're almost on a cyclic basis for each one of them. Uh, we haven't heard any complaints about tree trimming or anything like that. We've, um, we're starting to see the real benefit for implementing all of these. 
Uh, if there's any questions, I'll just skip over those. We've, we've gone over those in, in detail. Oh, those give you the numbers of what we got done this past year. So like manhole inspections, 961 out of 1,237. So you can see how quickly we're going through. The LED streetlight program was a three-year conversion from a grant that we received. We are now 78%, so you can see in North Reading we have 367 lights to go, and those do include the ones that were shut off that we are now turning on. The next slide uh, talks about the credits that come out of uh, switching to an LED light program. You can see all the numbers. Kind of good slide, a little bit to take in. Mike? Would you just point out the, the savings to, uh, to North Reading based on the conversion? Um, I mean, this, this, this 7,000, yeah. There would have, I, I mean, I think we talked about this a little bit too, and I, I, it just bothers me to keep bringing it up, but there would have been a little bit more savings. Um, I mean, there's good and bad to it. There, there was a, um, a capital cost component that was not being collected as part of the rate before I got there. So when we did the analysis, that piece was missing. The good point of that is that you were getting a discount all along. Um, the bad point was that it, it didn't drop as much as it could have if that capital had been in there. But now the capital is built in there, so this is the overall savings, and it includes all the ones that were shut off. So it's still, it's still a benefit. Um, you know, maintenance, and it will be reflected in the overall rate as well. Maintenance should go down. Um, we shouldn't be able to have to, you know, replace them for 10, 15, maybe even 20 years. So it's a great program, and we were very fortunate to win that grant. Double poles, everyone's favorite. So this is saying that North Reading, so in Comcast we have five ready to transfer, Fire Department 37, Reading Light 33, um, combined with uh, 13 transfers and 20 pulls, and Verizon 23. And Engines <coughs> is a program that everyone who's attached to the poll shares. If they're not on it, we're trying to find out who's not on it, get them on it. And basically when it's time, for, when the new poll gets put in, we start transferring, and when everyone's done transferring, the poll butt gets taken out. The person that puts the poll in and takes the poll butt out is the custodial of your area. The custodian in your area is Reading Light. The custodian in Wilmington is Verizon. We have the whole service territory split in half. So even though the ownership of each poll is 50-50 ownership on the poll, the custodial area is split. And so um, that's why you have uh, poll polls in under Reading Light. Um, well, I met with Mike earlier and we discussed the North Reading Fire Department in the 37. Uh, so I went back and what we did is we ran the list of all the streets and um, my dog kind of ate it a little bit. So it's a little uh, we've heard that excuse before. The dog is your homework. <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave this with you. But what I did is I, um, I know, it's just dog print. That's all. Um, so what I did when I got back, we didn't have time to verify all 37, so I gave a sampling handful to the assistant general foreman and a sample to the night man, and I sent them out for an hour, and every single one of them that was checked uh, is accurate on that list. So I think based on that sampling, I think we're at 37. So I can work with you, and we can help out. I know you have a new uh, fire chief coming in, and we just make sure they get on engines and we can move forward. And Colleen, where are we in the pecking order as far as uh, coming off the pole? I mean, there's a certain order that who's ever on there has to come off? Uh, it's typically electric is always at the top, and then, it's, and then after that is a variety of telecommunications. Fire is usually the bottom. Yeah, that's so you'll have Verizon and then Comcast, uh, but they may have multiple fiber. You know, Verizon still has some of their old copper, which I wish they would take away, we're working with them on that. Um, Not so fast, because that's going to cost us a lot of money. Why? <laughs> to because our fire department communications are tied to those. They're tied to? Copper. Oh, to the copper that they're using? Or oh, so they're still using it? We're transitioning out of it, but right now we still rely oh. on it for so, radiation. Okay. No real hurry. Mr. Masseri. 
That's good to know because some. That's good to know. I didn't know that. You can give Michael a call. He'll fill you in. <laughs> so I, I have a question related to the. Uh, management of the poles and the connectivity. Uh, there's a potential that North Reading will have to put in uh, its own uh, INET, connecting all the town buildings and schools. Right. Uh, I assume we have to go through Reading to get that set up. Not to do it, but to get permission, or how does that work? Yeah, you have to fill out a, a, an attachment agreement. We have other towns that have wires that are connected to the poles. We just have to have an attachment agreement. And this is one of the reasons why, because they would have to go into engines so that they realize that it's their turn to, you know, move their wire. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as long as there's room on the pole and there's no make ready work, then we really don't have a problem with towns attaching. Um, but we do have some you know, wires that have been abandoned in place, and that becomes kind of a problem. So I think, you know, with the attachment agreement, you know, it's just making sure that when you're done with it, that we, we have an agreement that it gets removed. Um, you know. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. But yeah, so, and don't forget, we have a loop too, so depending on where you're trying to get to, I'm more than happy to help out. So those are the double poles. And that's a snapshot of January 16th. So since the last time I was here, it's gone down significantly. But then we may have added 10 new poles. I didn't bring the last one. I meant to. Because I know last time it was a little higher. So I don't know what it was. It's like 90. 99. 90 something. It took over like 10 a week. Yeah. We really got on it after you gave it to me the last time. <laughs> we were kind to you. Oh, you were kind, but I got on it. <laughs> um, we didn't really have a problem at the last storm. So this is the one in October, which hit North Reading pretty hard. So this is kind of our, so the way it works at, at Reading is we have a control room, which is being rebuilt into uh, a smart grid um, center, which will have you know, GIS outage management, and it will look like, um, you know, a dispatch center that it's supposed to look like, where an IVR system is operating similar. If you know people from IOUs, they'll get a text on their phone, or you can look at a map and you can see where the outage is at, and it'll give you the estimated time of restorations instead of us trying to answer a thousand calls and having the guys tweet out when they're also trying to switch out the system. It makes it very difficult and can be dangerous. <coughs> so we're trying to um, you know, limit the amount of calls. Uh, and then this year we started a liaison phone, which I had given Mike and the fire police chief. It's an unpublished number uh, so that the selectmen or whoever um, can, can call and get a particular update. If the police and fire are reporting an outage, there's one number. But if they're calling to say, hey, how's it going? Should we need to be setting up some shelters? those type of discussions that we're there available with this liaison person. I'm usually sitting right there and we can and we can help out. But that way we're not in the control. Because this whole smart grid and having these switches that are smart and they're looking to find where the fault is and they're bringing power back around to you know to isolate the problem, get as many people back in power. It's, you know, there's a lot of focusing on that that um, that we need our control room to do, which is why we're you know, investing in this smart grid uh, type of system. So I think by next by next winter, we'll have some portals and customer information portals that are installed. So I think you'll see a big difference. Mr. Masseri. Uh, it seems to me over the past couple of years, uh, you've put a lot more effort into maintenance of the trees in, in the area of the poles and everything, which seems to have been positive. Do you have any data that uh, supports? Um, you know, I didn't put it. I don't. I didn't put it in this slideshow. We do that every month for the for the board. And yes, the pie chart does show that animal contacts are getting a little bit better because we put animal guards up. The tree trimming is really starting to pay off. In um, this particular storm, though, it wasn't necessarily 
the trimming and the branches and the leaders that were falling. It was the whole entire <laughs> tree was lifting up out of the earth. And, um, and some people, you know, unless you see it happening, people don't realize that, you know, we have to have a crane. We have to get a crane in there before red light can even go in. So typically the police are there and <coughs> wires that are down. We'll go in and secure them, uh, you know, on foot. And then the, the, the cranes will come in, you know, chop up the tree, move the tree, and then red light can get in there. And it's a pretty long process. It's probably worth going to see one sometime because, um, you know, they, some folks just don't understand why we're not there immediately. And, um, and we also try to be fair to each town. We, we prioritize and we try to send the same amount of crews to each town and depending on how dangerous it is. But most of the towns did have one large tree or two large trees that we were working on, but we only have one crane with Mayor. So he was making his rounds. Um, and we do try to do it fairly, and, and again, I as long as there's not arcing wires or um, you know, life-threatening situations, um, you know. yes? Uh, my comments weren't critical of what happened in October. Yeah. My comments were that it seems like the extended effort of pre-Maine has just yeah. reduced the number of incidents. Yeah, I think it has too. The next time I come, I'll bring the slides on, on the outage causes, um, and we can go over that. We have industry standards, KP, Sadie, and it tells you exactly what's causing what, and um, it's kind of an interesting thing, but you're absolutely right. It is helping. It just doesn't help when the whole tree falls over. Colleen? Yeah. I could just bring you back for um, sure. a minute about this change that you're going to make in this center. Yeah. Um, when you push out information, I know you're using Twitter, right? but you have your app, but the app doesn't push out information. It doesn't send information to people that have the app, it, it, at least the way it, it seems to be today, unless I haven't done an update or something. But that would be helpful because we did get the word out and a lot of people did download the app, but right. I think your app could be a lot more useful if we could get the push information to people in North Reading that are on the app. Right. Or you mean to, so... Um, so when you have a power outage, you, you know, it should notify outages in these areas and then update. It just right. pushes the information. Right. Let me, let me ask Mark why that doesn't work. Um, it has, like, a, another issue with Twitter on the app is it doesn't timestamp it. And I don't know exactly why. We've been trying to work with, um, you know, with the app company and with Twitter of why we couldn't get that to work. Um, See, I don't use Twitter. I know a lot of people don't use Twitter, but having an app on your phone, once you're in, you're logged yeah. in, it should just be able to send right. you the information. And you want to report, right. it's very good. If I want to report an outage, yeah. it takes 10 seconds and I can do it. Right. And I can right. see that it goes through, but right. there's nothing coming the other way. Yeah. Let me, let me ask Mark from IT why it won't push. But you know, you're building an app and then you're using other apps on top of the apps. And sometimes it just, you know, that you won't be able to get a push notification because you're, again, we're building a Frankenstein in the interim of building this smart control room with the yeah. customer information portal and the IVR. That's, really well, that's the only reason why I mentioned it is you go yeah. through this new build out to try to incorporate some of that technology. I think it makes the instant, even for our police officers, if they have that app on there, most of them have smartphones. If they have the app and they get the information pushed to them as well, the right. communication will be pretty quick. Sure. Sorry, yeah. The new outage management system has that capability, like one of the colleagues mentioned, and one of the modules is customer portal. And the customer portal, what it does, it gives you, if you sign in and actually you register, it goes right to your cell phone and when tells you. Out? That's coming out, uh, we should have the, uh, the customer portal by April, May of this year. And That's then great. by next year, you're gonna have IVR also added to that. Excellent. Which means it's going to send you a message that you know we know you're out before you even call us. We let you know that you're out. So when you have that implemented, it'd be really helpful if we could get you to come back and we present it here. Yeah, so yes. the public gives some yeah, training. Okay, okay. okay, that's perfect. I will ask <coughs> Mark in the interim though. Okay. Yeah, all that same uh, getting uh, news out to the consumer. Yeah. The biggest way people communicate in this town is the North Reading Community Connection on Facebook as far yeah. as social media. Can you guys put updates on there? Well, because we were going to an IVR, we yeah. weren't gonna we weren't gonna go from Twitter and then add Facebook, because um, 
I don't know, a lot of people expect that we can reply to their comments, and we were just using it as an interim measure to try to get information that had never been sent out before. You know what I mean? We can um, you know, we, I, I, I can ask, too, if there's a way to use Hoot, Hootsuite to, to push Twitter out uh, onto a Facebook without us having a Facebook, so I can ask that. That's I mean, just that, the biggest, quickest reach to get people. Yeah, in our okay. Time. All right. Thank no you. No IVR has the capability to text, uh, to send you voicemail, yeah. as well as email. But uh, depending on which system, the various process you're going to get, they have capability of pushing into the, uh, all the applications as well as you know, the Facebook, I believe. But we have to look into that, you know, depending on where you get it. Please let us know. Thank you. Please continue. Sure. So um, just wrapping it up, the strategic vision, uh, we're, we're, we're doing a strategic roadmap in each of the divisions. Uh, so pow like power supply, out 20 years. Uh, IT, out 20 years. And I know you say to yourself, well, how can you go out IT 20 years? Well, you're looking at the technology in the first to the five years. Um, but they're also supporting other divisions, like the new substation that we're building in, in uh, Wilmington where IT supports them, and then you're also incorporating succession for people that are retiring or whatever. So these strategic visions, now that all of the career developments are done, all the job descriptions have been rewritten, uh, that's our next goal is uh, coming up with the roadmap. So that when I retire, I can say, it's all fixed, and here you go, it's all right there, and um, it'll be good to go. So um, uh, let's see, can you... Um, I think that's it. I think I went all of those. And then that is the governor and me <laughs> and me and Jane and Commissioner Judson uh, of um, the DPU and Tom Alula, who's in our group. And we just won a million dollars, I'm sure you saw it in the newspaper, for the largest um, battery storage facility in the state, and it's so big that it's even bigger than cumulatively all battery storage in the state of Massachusetts. So it's a five megawatt, and we are putting it in North Reading. So it's going right next to our distributed generator. Um, we did not accept the, uh, we did not apply for the grant by asking for the money to build it because the technology changes so quickly. So we're taking the million dollar grant and it pays down the power supply costs. So it comes right off your bill. So that's the way we're, we're taking the grant money. And so it's very exciting. Uh, Tom Olillo is the project manager on it. And um, we're going to be partnering with NextTerra uh, Energy Group. And we should have it built by this coming peak. So it should be done by June. And it's super exciting. So. Um, there was uh, 69 applications, and they were only had 10 million, but they ended up bumping it up to 20 million dollars. So the only other one that got a large um, storage was Taunton, and they're going to build their own, but it wasn't five megawatts; it was less than that. I can't remember if it was three or four. So we're very excited about that project coming, adding to our renewables, reducing our carbon footprint, and, uh, and we're excited to be doing it in North Reading. I think that's the last one. That's the best picture. <laughs> that's uh, just a picture of our first three. Remember, I said, you know, we had um, the three covers that when we went um, because when I came here, I was like, well, how much have we spent in making this? How many copies are we making? So we went paperless the first year. So that was the first year, the second year, the third year, and we got to see the, the new high school one. So don't forget to shred the peak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Any questions for Colleen and her team? Just, uh, just a couple of comments. One was uh, the chairman and I were able to go down to the ribbon cutting for your natural gas yeah. uh, generator. Quite a piece of equipment and uh, very quiet. Very quiet. Very quiet, which was uh, tremendous to not hear. And um, again, and I was one of those neighborhoods affected back in uh, October with my neighbors, and we were out 27 hours. But communication on the ground was very good because most of our neighbors were pretty informed because 
you know, the Reading Light uh, employees were very welcoming and as we were trying to get up Oakdale Road, which wasn't easy, um, along with the local police department, fire department, we were able to get information anyway. So yeah. uh, it was a huge undertaking. I mean, it looked like a disaster area. <laughs> and it, uh, it was surprising how well um, yeah, it, it went. Come out well. People weren't happy about being out 24 hours, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, it really did go well. And uh, credit to your uh, people that are working there on the ground. They, they do a great job. Yeah, and it's running well. I mean, we're, we, we try to hit 12 uh, transmission peaks every month, you know, so you run it a few times trying to catch that peak, and then one annual peak that's through the summer. We try to catch that, and, um, you know, the more we can hit them, the more money we can save. Yeah. So it goes back to everybody. Yeah, very impressive, though. Wasn't it? it was fun. It was yeah. very impressive. Nice design. Well, thank you for coming in this evening. We do appreciate it. And we hope we'll have you back here in July when you have your new technology implemented. Okay, great. All right? Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And the agenda brings us to a show cause <coughs> hearing for A1 Auto Sales. Uh, and I'm going to turn over the chairman position to Mrs. Minupelli because I'm going to recuse myself only because one of the employees is a neighbor of my brother-in-law. And I just want to, just to be safe and sorry, I don't want to show any conflict of interest. So I'll be refusing myself, turning the chair over to Mrs. Minupelli. And uh, Madam Chair, I'd like uh, the record to show that I too will be recusing myself. I will not be participating in any of the discussion. I will not be uh, taking any, any vote and offering any opinion on the matter as I have a family member who, who holds a class two license here in town. So I will not be participating nor voting. Thank you. Begin. This hearing involves the Class II dealer's license of A1 Auto Sales at 144 Main Street, North Reading. Licensee Joseph Mangello, and I see that you've stepped forward. Could you identify yourself by uh, yes. name and address? Uh, members of the council, my name is Rich DiGirolamo. I'm an attorney for 142 and 144 Main Street, LLC. Uh, they are the landlord of the property. Uh, I, along with Mr. Peter Piantadosi, am also I'm also here not only as the attorney for the owner, uh, but as a co-owner along with Mr. Piantadosi. It's my belief that the licensee will not be attending the hearing this evening. Are you, Attorney um, DiGirolamo, are you, are you here to represent the licensee? I am not. I'm okay. Representing well, I'd owner. ask if the licensee is present, if the licensee could come forward or the licensee's representative come forward. So we'll make a note for the record. The licensee is not here. It is 8:45. We do have our. Uh, we this is a, this is a violation hearing. So we're going to proceed. How how we're going to proceed is hearing from our enforcement officials, hearing the information that they have to present. Hopefully the licensee will appear so we can hear from the licensee. But we're here to discuss the alleged violations and the information that our enforcement officials have, have to present. If you have factual information pertaining to these alleged violations, we'd be happy to hear from you. But how we'll proceed is hearing from our enforcement officials first, and then hopefully hearing from the licensee. If the licensee does appear, he was noticed to appear. So if there's anything factually after you've heard that you want to present, that pertains to the alleged violations, we'd be happy to hear from yes, you. Yes, I'd only ask if you give us an opportunity at that time to present um, our position on this. Sure. Thank sure. you. Okay, so we have uh, Chief Murphy and Detective Lieutenant Romeo. And why don't we just begin with you, you giving us a brief summary. We did see the, that the, the uh, January 10th notice of hearing to the licensee requested his presence and that of his representative. We did see the um, immense amount of documentation that was prepared by you, Chief, and by you, Lieutenant, but we'd like to, you to give us a summary with regard to what you determined in your investigation. Okay, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so I will give a summary, and please stop me at any time if you have any questions. Um, I will keep it brief, because um, a lot of the complaints are, are repetitive. Um, but I think it's important that we, we at least get some of the facts out from the complaints that have brought it forward to us. Um, excuse me. So during the month of December of 2017, we received a complaint from a consumer alleging deceptive practices at 144 Main Street. The complaint identified that business as A1 Auto Sales. 
Um, we began an investigation. We sent an undercover police um, team in to the location to determine whether or not the complaint was valid. The officers reported that they too experienced the same deceptive practices um, regarding mileage on a vehicle. At that point, I ordered an administrative inspection to occur at that um, location. Um, as you uh, revealed earlier, I did give a packet, um, several documents um, detailing the investigation, but also supporting documents from the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office of complaints that were filed against the same business owner at A1 Auto Sales, as well as a civil complaint of movement district court. Uh, the complaints described similar deceptive behavior, which appeared to be an ongoing uh, pattern of business practices. The complaints go all the way back to March of, of 2017. Uh, the reports and additional supporting document that I did submit revealed violations of A1's auto license um, conditions, deceptive practices, misrepresentations of vehicle's conditions, misrepresentation of accurate mileage, violations of class two licensing statutes, as well as lemon law violations. Um, just to briefly go over the, the first complaint that did come to us was regarding um, deception on the true mileage of a motor vehicle. Um, I did have our officers go in and, and confirm that one particular vehicle was advertised um, at having only 51,000 miles on it. Um, the, the, the vehicle had um, documentation through the title as well as um, when the, um, the uh, owner at A1 Auto Sales bought the vehicle at auction, that the vehicle did have an odometer um, mileage discrepancy. Um, so we sent the officers in to try, to try to determine whether or not the complaint was valid. Um, again, the, there was an internet search on the Carfax which indicated that the odometer was replaced in 2011 and set to zero. The original mileage at the time was set was 60,000 miles. Now the, re the repair was legal and it was recorded correctly. However, the, the vehicle was advertised for sale at A1 Auto Sales in December of 2017 at having only 51,000 miles. It was clear that the vehicle had over 111,000 miles at that time. Um, very similar to the complaint from the complaint that um, came to us originally, our, our undercover offices tried to inquire about the mileage. Um, the salesperson was very evasive about it and essentially stopped all contact and we started questioning the true veracity of the 51,000 miles. Um, noting that as soon as the contact stopped with the complaint, it was re-advertised again for 51,000 miles. When, I, when the um, detectives went in, um, undercover, again, once we started questioning, they stopped all communications. The vehicle was again advertised at only 51,000 miles. So it was clear that they were looking for somebody to take the bait and buy the vehicle believing it was only 51,000 miles. Um, so it's important that, that, um, to note that the Lieutenant Romeo and one of our detectives did go in. Um, we tried to contact the person that we were um, originally dealing with, um, but it seems that he only is there by appointment, so they weren't able to talk to him. Um, the, the person that was there, asked uh, the officers to go look at the vehicles, which they did. Lieutenant Romeo, who was there, um, noticed that there was a sticker that was required by law to be placed on the vehicle once an odometer is changed. That, that sticker was on the vehicle. Um, so even if they didn't know it at the time, which we believe they did, when they bought the vehicle, it was clearly, uh, the sticker was on the vehicle, um, that, the, that the odometer was replaced. Um, there was no lemon law or warranty information as required by Mass General Law on this vehicle or any other vehicles that were in the back lot of, of the um, sales, the A1 Auto sales. Uh, the detectives asked about the warranty and if the vehicle passed inspection and the salesman stated that he has a guy who could get a sticker. Um, just a note on that, many of the complaints that we've um, reviewed have that same, essentially, we'll get you a sticker. Um, we take that to mean that it's not going to be get gotten at a legitimate business. Um, that, and, and, and many of the complaints detail that he's going to get his guy to get you a sticker. Um, again, like I said, the Attorney General's Office and Movement District Court had complaints filed there. Both uh, those complaints um, 
relayed the same information about the sales and the town that we'll be able to get you a sticker. And also, many of the vehicles that are advertised has, um, in quotes, 100% will get you a sticker. Um, the, the advertisements are usually on Craigslist, um, on Carfax, they're very vague about what type of condition the vehicles are in, but only that the vehicle will run that it'll be able to get a sticker. Um, while the detectives were there, they asked to see the title for that particular vehicle, which they were showed. Um, it was clear right on the front of the title that there was a mileage discrepancy, and, and they typically, in, in situations like that, they just put 999,000 miles right on the um, right on the title. Um, after the detectives went in, the vehicle was then again reposted with only uh, advertisers only having 51,000 miles. The detectives then contacted the um, salesperson again um, to ask him about the discrepancy with the mileage. He says, I know nothing about it. He said, just look at the engine, it's clean. And then he, he went and said that he didn't do much research on this particular vehicle. And he thinks there's around 60 to 70,000 miles on it. Um, just to reiterate again, the Attorney General's office has at least five complaints on file um, against A1 Auto Sales. Um, when we did the investigation in late December through January 10th, we, um, the detective continued to check the company's website, all the advertisements that they, we previously have um, looked at. They still claim to have 20 to 30 vehicles on site for sale. We've confirmed that through photographs, which I believe um, was included in the package that I sent. Um, again, we did a, an administrative search. Um, inspection, I should say, which is uh, pursuant to Mass General Law 14066. We did meet with the owner, um, Joe Mangiello. Um, originally, when the detectives went in, they were met by a person by the name of Marco. Um, that person made a phone call, and within 10 to 15 minutes, the owner, Joey Mangiello, showed up. Um, that person, Marco, then walked to the back of the building. We never saw him again. Um, Mangillo had essentially stated that um, he only had one employee. That employee's name was Mike Mohammed. Um, come to find out, there's at least three or four employees there, one of which was this person, Marco, who went out the back door and essentially fled the building. Um, we determined that that person to be from some old mass and that there's an active mark for the rest, which is probably why he went out the back door. Um, so essentially, uh, the owner asked the detective why he was there. The detective explained to him that he was there to do an administrative search. He wanted to see all sales records, um, titles for all the vehicles on site. Um, essentially, we wanted to do a review of the records to see if there's any other deceptive practices. Um, Mangillo was unable to show us any records other than a, a screenshot of um, some sort of online inventory system that he had in place. Um, which really wasn't accurate. He didn't even remember the password to it. So um, the last date on that particular online site was March of 2017. So it was a, a, at least a six to seven month um, lapse in, in recording types of vehicles that were sold there. Um, at that point, I just wanted to note this, at that point, um, Mangiola had made a phone call to somebody, and within 10 minutes, another person had showed up, um, came in, and was very loud, essentially said that he'll come in and pay 13,000 cash for a vehicle that was um, outside of the parking lot. Um, but I just wanted to note that the, the um, Mangiola had asked the mail if he could wait, but then the mail just said, call cops are dirty, um, and then left. I, the detective thought it was what he thought was in trying to intimidate him as a law enforcement officer trying to do his job. I just wanted that noted here so you can see the type of practices that are in play at that type of business. Um, so we did ask, again, all the, we wanted to see all the sales which we were, were in, unable to see. Um, so we, to this day, we don't have any records of the sales that have occurred that, um, at that site. Um, the, the owner did ask why we were doing the inspection, and the detective explained, um, you know, the amount of vehicles they had for sale, the complaints about the deceptive practices. And at that point, Mangiola said, "I know you're right. You got me." 
Um, we asked about the employees again. He says he only has one employee um, named Mike Mohammed. To this day, we have not identified that particular person. We've identified at least three other employees. Um, we do have business cards for three different employees, so it was clear he was being deceptive and who was actually even working there. Um, we did get a phone call, I mean, I'm sorry, a phone number for the person, Marco. We did, um, we did talk to him eventually, but um, he gave us a false date of birth. Um, we were unable to actually match who he, was, who he said he was with any motor vehicle records on, um, on file. So again, um, we've seen a, we've seen a host of different people that are working there. We're trying to identify them, um, and we've been essentially um, given the runaround by the owner as to who actually works there. So that has not, still to this day, has not been determined who the employees actually are. Um, so just um, I just wanted to review two other. Uh, complaints. Um, these were a little bit different. One of them being, um, I should say, they're, they're similar but they're different because there's what appears to be fraud and forgery involved. Um, similar complaints in that people were sold vehicles and when they signed the contract, um, one particular case, the, the, the price for the vehicle went up almost $3,000. Um, there's no explanation as to why um, the person in their complaint says that they were rushed. Um, essentially, they, by the time they signed the paperwork and got the loan documentation, it was already too late. They've addressed it through the Attorney General's office and that case is still under investigation. But in one other particular case, um, the, the complaint actually said it was not her signature on the loan documents. So the loan documents that she signed was different from the ones that were actually presented to her at the final uh, sale, um, which again, it was at least a couple of thousand dollars more than what she agreed to pay for the vehicle. And actually what the vehicle was actually advertised for, um, so they just added to the price um, with, without any explanation. Um, so one, one particular person, the vehicle was purchased for $7,400, but uh, eventually the um, total sale price um, came up to 11,775. And that seemed to be a common practice um, with several complaints that we received. Uh, the last complaint I just want to bring up after the, um, after the initial hearing um, a couple weeks ago, the North Reading transcript ran an article. We did get a complaint from a North Reading resident um, the, that next Monday. Essentially, very similar um, complaints regarding whether or not the vehicle can pass an inspection. Um, the person actually had to tie the gas tank um, with ropes to the vehicle because it was falling off. Check engine light was on. I went back to see the salesman. The salesman um, essentially told him that he would get the vehicle to pass inspection. Um, the, that complaint was never shown any warranty information, um, nor Lenoma information. Um, the victim did actually ask uh, Mark about the uh, Massachusetts Lemon Law, and he told him that the Lemon Law was only for vehicles from 2014 and newer, so he couldn't use the Lemon Law against the dealership. That's not accurate um, how the law is applied. Um, so, you know, it's certainly a, more of a misleading information, so they, were, you know, they wouldn't have to be responsible for getting the vehicle fixed. Um, the victim did ask that, that, the, uh, that the dealer should either fix the vehicle or give him some money back. Um, and, and Mark had told him that he would lose money if he fixed the truck and refused to fix it. And the victim did contact the Attorney General's office. Um, and just as we started to do records, we received at least three other complaints um, over the past year, um, which we believe now, looking back on it, is, is most likely because of the deceptive practices. One of them was um, a disturbance between the um, a sale, salesperson and the customer um, because things weren't um, the way they were supposed to be. Um, at the time, we referred it as a civil matter. We weren't aware that the type of practice was going on there. Uh, we've received two other complaints, which we referred um, the complaints to the Attorney General's office. 
Um, so as far as the Attorney General's Office and Office of Consumer Affairs, they, they don't connect the complaints, so we're still working with them to determine actually how many complaints are um, have been levied against A1 Auto Sales. Um, but it's clearly more than any business we've had in North Reading. I, I can tell you that. Um, so just to, just in summary, where you know, this is pretty much a common practice. I don't know any legitimate business that's going on there. Um, we've asked that they provide us the records to, to show that they are conducting that. We just haven't received any. Do you have anything that you wanted to add to that, Lieutenant I mean, Detective? Um, as you know, the packet's very long, and it keeps growing daily. Uh, if Chief summarized you know, briefly what the facts are. Uh, there's much more detail in everything that he had mentioned. Uh, it goes to the intent. You know, the deceptive, not only deceptive sales practices, but the deception they showed us, even when we were proposed as customers, and when we identified ourselves as law enforcement. Pursuant to Mass General Law to do an inspection, we were lied to, misled, uh, ran the gamut. <clears throat> so it's, it's ever evolving every day, something new comes in on it. As you can see, the fold that we're, we're running out of the room in that one, we need another one. So, so. Do the board members have any questions for our enforcement officials? I would just like to thank uh, Just thank the North Burning Police Department for the work they've done on this. This is enlightening. I, I went through probably 120 pages of just allegations here, and it's, it's troubling. I'd like to hear what some of the folks that are connected have to say about this, because I, you know, we need to make sure our consumers and our residents are, can trust the local businesses, and, and this is beyond the pale. I'm very upset at what I'm reading. Just want to stick that on the record, but thank you, gentlemen, and your staff for what you've done. This question for the town uh, manager, town administrator. Michael, we sent out a notice of the public hearing to A1. Yes. And was that done in writing? And was it sent in <coughs> certified form or something? So through you, Mr. Chairman, the notices, there were three notices actually delivered relative to this hearing. One was the initial hearing notice, which was sent two days after the board voted to schedule the hearing. That was sent via hand delivery, so delivered in person to the location, and then also by U.S. mail. And the same was the case for two supplemental notifications, which were also provided to the board for this evening. So there should have been a total of six different intersections between the town of North Reading and the establishment, three of which were in person and three of which were by U.S. mail. Have they responded back as to why they're not here tonight? No, I've received no response to my knowledge. And it's a six car license, six cars sales at any point in that, time. That's correct. The license is issued for six cars. And just to, to for, the, for the record, <coughs> how many cars did you observe when you went on your? Uh, the internet was, the internet today has 31 cars posted on their website today. I can tell you there was more than that on site in different locations on the property. And that's just on the website, but there's other, they were advertising on Craigslist, Facebook, and other apps, cars to sell that were not incorporated on their website. So the numbers. So daily is, is between 20 and 30. So when you look at their, the um, advertisements, that you can clearly see that the photos are taken in North Reading, uh, right in front of the gas station. And there's also an area in the back of where the motor home, I mean, the, the trailer park is in, in the back where the homes are. Um, there's a whole fenced in area there. There's at least another 15 cars in the back that we were unaware of. Um, but there is a fenced in area there. And today, later in the day today, there seemed to be a lot of movement to uh, reduce the inventory of the vehicles. Um, what are the other reasons? Any other questions board members have for the enforcement So I think at this point, Attorney DiGirolamo and Mr. Pianadosi, if you wanted to come up, if you have any other input on these allegations that <coughs> you want the board to consider. Sure before, Thank uh, you. Uh, before they members of the excuse board. Me one, excuse me. Sure. Madam Chair, before they start, could I just ask a few questions so I understand their relationship with the licensee? Because I'm not sure the connection. 
Yeah. Um, General, what is your relationship with Mr. Mangiello? He's a tenant of he's a tenant of ours. Okay. And do you have any relationship with A1 Motor Sales? No. Okay. And um, do you have you did Mr. Mangiello tell you about these hearing notices? Uh, I do not know Mr. Mangiello. Yeah. Mr. Pantadosi does know him. And Could I Mr. Pantadosi sure. step up sure. too as well? Absolutely. I just trying to understand the nexus here. I'm not sure why you guys are here tonight. I want to make so, sure. So through the through the chair, obviously, yeah. uh, thank you for allowing us to speak. We were notified um, middle of last week that, that there was there was these hearing notices going on. Um, I immediately demanded from the tenant that I see the the, the file that they had received. Um, obviously, we take this very seriously. We have spent a significant amount of money in renovating that gas station yep. and that property um, all the way through from the tenants, electrical systems, um, all the way up. Um, at which point, um, just through the board, I was told by Mr. Mangello that they would not be attending today, um, which I strongly advise against because we had also um, explained to them that they were in violation of their lease uh, in regards to some of the terms of their lease and that we would not be you know, if in the event that this was to pursue, uh, that they would be responsible, and we just came to an amiable agreement to remove cars immediately, get off the premises, and try and work forward to uh, to move in the right direction. So you, um, you guys, both you two gentlemen, have no financial interest with Mr. Mangiello? None. Okay, you're just merely landlord-tenant? Landlord-tenant. And what is your position on what you I, heard? In full disclosure, I've known Mr. Mangiello uh, for a period of years. I never, never thinking that you know, this would be a circumstance. I yeah. thought him to be um, a good tenant. I, I think that maybe financial issues have caused this circumstance. Um, you know, so it's, it's, I think it's just kind of evolved out of, spun out of control. And obviously I'm not, uh, being a automobile, so, so financially I own, I own a significant amount of real estate and also an automobile dealership. That's how I started when I was 18 years old. Um, I've got, 15 years down in Somerville of, a, of an unblemished A plus better business rating. Um, and um, also one of 20 dealerships that is actually respected enough by the registry of motor vehicles to actually issue my own license plates at my dealership. There, there are only 20 used car dealers within the state that, that have access to direct to the registry's servers. Um, so obviously I take this very seriously. Uh, our, uh, our initial circumstance it, when this came about, I reviewed the, the allegations, um, was not unhappy, was very unhappy about what I had seen in regards to the warranty, and just said to them, guys, listen, this is, this is it. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure the board wasn't, you know, based on these allegations, you know, the board, I, you know, I've never been in a front of a board like this under these circumstances under my own business, and I, and I don't appreciate being here tonight. Um, so, you know, respectfully, I contact uh, the town administrator uh, this, this afternoon, notifying that we would be present as, as the landowners. Um, we, we've done a lot to improve that property um, to benefit the residents that are long, lifelong North Reading residents out back, many of which wanted to come and speak on my behalf, and I just didn't want to keep them up till 9 o'clock at night. I just didn't feel that it was necessary. Um, but they're imp pretty impressed with the monies that we've spent in a trailer park. Um, so that being said, um, you know, so so I think amiably um, they're bowing out. So just to, to clarify that, that's the impression that I received and I kind of uh, strongly urged, let's put it that way. Um, so, you know, it, it is opposition as, as the landowners um, to potentially present an application at a later point to move forward with under my business, my corporation, um, regroup this, but I think I think systematically, if you look over time, the quality of automobiles they sold diminished, and as the quality diminished, problems come with that. Um, and I think it was you know it ended up being coming lack of cash flow. So um, you know I I would be glad to to work with North Reading Police in regards to any and all consumers to the best of my ability, um, even though it's not my place. Um, in regards to resolving consumer complaints to the best of my ability and seeing what I can do on my end. Well, if I, I may, Madam Chair. Why would you be, my why would you get involved? It's my property, and at the end of the day, I, I don't want people leaving my piece of property. I, I, I just, I don't, 
I wouldn't want that to happen. And, and I don't want to see people less fortunate who bought inexpensive cars. Um, and, and that's the case. Um, you know, a lot of these cars were $1,200, $1,500 cars. They, they become, you know, and it's, and it's, you know, what happens with that comes the circumstances you're talking about. You know, uh, it, it, you know, mileage discrepancy on things. You know, there's, there's, there becomes issues with that. So well, no, they, those issues don't become because you have an older car. You, they become because someone's so being no, fraudulent. The, so let me, if I yeah. could just let's just I I I think the board certainly appreciates your coming sure. forward. I think what we're here on though is is something totally different than maybe your future plans with your property. Although we certainly appreciate your sure. explaining that. Um, but I think what we, we need to address right now are the allegations sure. that are before yep, us. And, and, but we do appreciate your at least coming here. Thank at least so, someone from that property showed up, and that, that's, that's important to us. Is there anything else, Attorney DiGirolamo, you might want to say that hasn't already been said? Um, no. Because we do need to move forward with the hearing. Just, just that hopefully at the end of the day, um, I think the primary reason we're here is that we would like to bring an applicant, probably Mr. Pantadosi, back before you in the near future as an applicant for that license. He has an unblemished record as he represented to you. And um, because of the substantial investment that's made in that property, uh, we don't want this to somehow tarnish the property moving forward. So I just want to represent to the board that for all intents and purposes, we think the tenant is either packing or substantially out of there. Uh, but in the future, we will hopefully be back before you uh, in the very near future. And we think it, it'll probably be, at least on the interim basis, Mr. Piantadosi's uh, uh, corporation will be fine for the, for the license on this particular location. Thank you, for Thank you coming forward. So if the licensee has, is the licensee present? You don't see him here, Mr. Piano, do you? I'm sorry, no, you don't he, is see not, him. he is not present. He's and not. he in fact told me that he would not be present, so. Okay. So I think, I think at this point, I think if we're, we're just gonna conclude the presentation of, of the evidence and does the board have any findings? We should make some findings of fact before we take a vote on this. So we we'll close the public hearing first. Um, I would. Call the motion to close the public is, hearing. Is there anyone else that, that wants to come forward with any factual information on these allegations? Seeing none, hearing none, we're going to close that portion of the public hearing and proceed to findings of fact. So does the board have any findings that they want to make? Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I personally, like I said before, I'm troubled by the allegations. Um, the fact that they're not even here, that speaks volumes. Um, so first finding of fact, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the licensee did not appear at this did hearing. Did not appear and has received three notices to appear. I think it was a finding of fraud. I think there's misrepresentation. I think there's deceit. Um, and I don't think this is the type of business that should operate in our town. As you recall, at our last meeting, I spoke against terminating the license until we had a public hearing. I think we've given the uh, uh, one an order represent, and representatives an opportunity to come. Several notices that I asked a question, and therefore, uh, at this point, I think we have a no other decision to make than terminate the license. I'll, I'll add to some of those findings the fact that um, uh, North Reading Police Department received multiple consumer complaints that were investigated. Um, the deceptive practices that Mr. Schultz mentioned included deceptive advertising, odometer fraud, forgery, financial fraud in terms of the financial transactions that occurred that, that that were at least brought to the attention of the North Reading Police. Uh, North Reading Police investigators determined that Lemon Law, uh, A1 Auto was not providing Lemon Law information as required by law or at times was misrepresenting Lemon Law to consumers. Um, in terms of, of su the support for the decision that the board makes, I'd like to incorporate by reference the, the 
packet of documentation that was provided by the uh, uh, detective lieutenant and chief of the North Reading Police to support the board's decision. Um, in that included uh, information about five consumer complaints pending at the AG's office and three complaints, um, three consumer complaints received by the North Reading Police. There are safety issues involving this particular licensee with regard to the, the type of vehicles that they're selling to consumers. Um, during administrative inspections that occurred, uh, more than 20 vehicles were found for sale, although this is only a six-car license. I, and even as we sit here today, as we hear of this hearing and as the licensee is aware of the hearing, there, there are more than 20 advertised still for sale. Um, the landlord appeared um, together with his counsel and represented that this licensee is in violation of the lease at the premises. Um, the licensee could not and did not produce sales documentation at the request of the investigators who were doing an administrative inspection contrary to the law. Um, even acting oddly and employees acting evasive and oddly during that administrative uh, inspection, taking off and leaving the building and, and it was subsequent, subsequently determined that the employee who was identified in the paperwork as the driver of the vehicles was unlicensed and had a, an outstanding warrant issued. So the other matter of the deceptiveness includes basically false and incorrect information being presented to police investigators at the licensed establishment. And um, I also think just one or two more findings of fact that we, we heard from the presentation that at this point there are actually no sales records that were presented, um, no accurate data, data, which is a requirement of the law as well that this licensee is an ad is in violation of it. You don't have to add this, but I can certainly s state that this is probably the poster child of what not to do for any class two dealer here. But can, and uh, Mr. Mo Mr. Sorry. Mosier, yeah, just a question for the chief. Uh, since I get a sense this, this investigation is ongoing, will termination of the license create a problem for you with respect to this investigation? Because I think the investigation you did with this is a criminal investigation. It would not affect it at all. It wouldn't. Yeah, I just, the misrepresentation to the consumer, but also to our investigating officers, that's doubly troublesome to me. And oftentimes in these cases, there are mitigation or mitigatory factors. There's not one in this case that I can think of that would mitigate how I would vote on this issue. So. Does the, do the, does the board have any more findings of fact that you want to? So concluding that portion, I'll take a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to revoke the Class Two license of A1 auto sales located at 144 Main Street, effective immediately on January 22, 2018, and that the license sh shall must be delivered to North Reading Police Office no later than noontime tomorrow. And the board makes the following findings and support the revocation, incorporating as well as what Madam Chair just said, um, in her uh, colloquy. Violation of license conditions limited to six vehicles, well over 20 on site and advertised for sale. Number two, deceptive practices, misrepresentation of vehicle condition and mileage. Number three, violation of class two licensing statutes, such as keeping accurate record books on premises for inspection by authorities, that's Mass General Laws Chapter 140, Section 62. Obstructing or hindering authorized inspection, Mass General Laws Chapter 40, uh, ch section one, section 67, failure to provide current records misrepresenting that no titles were on premises. Number four, multiple consumer complaints filed with the Attorney General's office in 2017. Number five, failure to post the Lemon Law and warranty info on vehicles for sale. Do I have a second? Second. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Two. Abstain. Thank you for your help with this and your presentation. And I turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Wonderful job. Steve.
Okay, the next thing on the agenda this evening is the water meter replacement project update. And I'll turn that over to the town administrator. Uh, that's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, the Director of Public Works, Andrew Lafferty, is here along with the Water Superintendent, Mark Clark, and our uh, consultants relative to the water meter project are also here this evening. Uh, there was a PowerPoint presentation that was put in the meeting packet uh, on Thursday uh, for the board to review, and they have a similar presentation, I believe, to be run through here um, this evening. I think uh, it's important to note that not only is this uh, an update relative to a significant capital project that has been approved by the town, but that this is one that will have a very real and very direct impact on our residents in that we are talking about changing the meters that are located in their homes. So we're doing this to update the public as to the status of the project, but also to make the public aware that in the coming months there is going to be a direct interaction uh, with um, virtually every property here in North Reading by virtue of this project. With that, I will turn it over to the Public Works Director, Mr. Lafferty. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Lafferty, DPW Director. Uh, good evening. Um, as uh, the Town Administrator mentioned, we'll be giving an update on the North Reading Water Meter Program. Um, as you recall, the uh, Water Meter Replacement Program highlights. Um, <clears throat> currently, we're looking at replacing all the water meters within the town, um, the, pro the project We'll, we'll address those. The existing meters are 27 years old. Um, as you can see, the benefits that have included, that include this replacement, um, improved leak detection, better customer service, increased meter reading and billing efficiency, and reducing estimated bills and billing errors. Um, so the project has been put out to bid. Um, as you're aware, the funding was appropriated over the last two fiscal years. Um, Weston and Sampson is the construction and administrative services. Um, Margaret McCarthy is the engineer that, that's been working with us. She's here, she'll be speaking also. Um, Thai Sales is the, the supplier of the actual hardware and the fixed network system. Um, Tom Garrity is also here. Uh, he'll be here to answer any questions from uh, Thai Sales. And then um, Fels Engineering and USI Services will be the contractor doing the installation out in the field. There'll be the actual uh, on the ground uh, individuals that'll be going to all the businesses and residences to do the installation. And uh, Greg Provelli from USI is also here. Um, so this is the current project costs as, uh, as we get the project underway. Um, engineering services, the supply, which is essentially the meters and the hardware, the fixed network system, and then the installation is the actual installation of the meters in the residences and commercial buildings, uh, commercial businesses. But, uh, currently, the project's at uh, 1.7 million, um, and we, we hope to stay under budget. Yeah, you say currently, that it's currently, or lower, we hope. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, <coughs> Just a, a quick question, Andrew. How many homes are impacted by that? So we talk. You said the whole community. It's all, business, it's all business community and homes. All, all residences and all commercial buildings. Okay, so roughly how many installs? Forty-five hundred homes and three hundred businesses. How many businesses? Three hundred. Three hundred. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll turn it over to Margaret McCarthy from uh, Western Sampson to go through the project timeline and some of the details along with uh, Mark Clark. Good evening, Margaret McCarthy, uh, team leader with Weston and Sampson. As Andrew mentioned, um, we, this project has been ongoing for a little while. Um, you guys have been getting updates as it's, as it's been going along. We're now at the point where contracts have been signed with everybody, so we're moving forward. Um, what's going on in January is we had kickoff meeting with the contractor. We're starting to finalize the locations of the collectors, which are going to be the um, towers that collect the meter reading information, and then some billing system modifications that are needed in order to accept all of this new data that will be coming in. 
In February, we'll be installing the network that will be reading the meters, and we will be doing some um, test installations to make sure that um, the billing system modifications and things like that are working properly before we go and start fully installing all 4,800 meters. Between March and October of 2018, that's when we will be looking at actually installing the water meters. Um, typical equipment, Mark brought over some of the equipment so that you can see what the meters and the boxes look like. And we've also provided equipment um, pictures up here. Um, the water meters are usually uh, down in people's basements. Uh, in very few locations do you have them in meter pits outside the houses. So we are talking about a small impact to everybody as we look to replace that uh, equipment that is over 27 years old. This is uh, information on the Neptune Register. One of the reasons, as Andrew had mentioned, we are looking to replace these meters is to be able to provide customers with more information in terms of the water that they're using. Um, the Neptune Register now allows for reading down to one-tenth of a gallon. Um, you do not get that granularity with the, the technology that is currently installed in the system. This allows you to do things like leak detection, um, backflow, um, flagging. So this, what's shown here on this slide is just a picture of how you read your new water meters because it is a little bit different. The technology has changed. It's not a manual. It's more electronic now. And this would be provided to the homeowners at the end of the meter installation, which we're going to talk about the process in a, in a future slide. The customer notification, um, which this is a part of, as people will be hopefully watching this meeting, we are going to be starting with the public outreach. This will include a water bill insert in February. <coughs> it will include newspaper <coughs> notification of the meter replacement program. It will include website um, update as well. So any media type that we can reach out to the customers to let them know what to expect, that is what we're planning on targeting. As we start to move into the project, there will be direct mailings by Thalsh and USI asking them to get in contact with them to schedule the appointments. This is a sample of what the direct mailing would look like. It will be a postcard with the town seal on it, asking them, letting them know that USI will be in the area and that they please contact them to schedule an appointment, either through the telephone number or the website that is provided. Um, it also provides a little bit of details of, of we need somebody home over the, uh, over the age of 18 at the time of the installation. The installation should take no more than 45 minutes with a small interruption in the water service of about 15 minutes. This, all of this information will be provided in previous notifications, but also in this direct mailing as well. This is a screenshot of what the website looks like where customers will be directed to make their appointments. Um, there is also a telephone number because not everybody would will be wanting to use a website. They want to talk to somebody about what's <coughs> the program. So the procedure, what, what do the customers need to know? Um, they will receive a notice via mail asking them to make an appointment uh, when USI is working in their area. We are doing this locationally so that um, the installer is not basically going all over the town. We are looking to start in areas, um, and the areas will be... What was the area that we talked about potentially targeting um, uh, as a first? One of the areas we talked, we talked about going into some of the newer areas for the pilot testing, so maybe the, the McIntyre neighborhood, which has all new meters, we know all the, the valves to shut off will work in those houses, so if we want to get a, a quick number of meters in there just for testing purposes, going into one of the newer neighborhoods. But we're, we're, we will be going sequentially from neighborhood to neighborhood. We're not going to do a bulk mailing in order to get everyone uh, that postcard at the same time. So, and this is controlled too in order to be able to provide the customers with an appointment that is a very short period out as opposed to having to have them schedule months out. Um, so they'll call or go to the website to make an appointment. The installer, the installations will be between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday but with limited evening and weekend appointments available for those who need it. Um, and they will also be accommodating special requests from the commercial customers who may need to accommodate their working hours. Um, so uh, that will all be accommodated by USI. USI will arrive 
um, for the installation. They will be, they will all have background checks prior to them even starting this project. That's part of this whole submittal process that we're in the process of doing now. Um, they'll be badged and they'll be in marked vehicles. In addition, we will be providing um, the police department with notifications of the areas that they'll be working in in case uh, residents call to ask questions about the installer who, in case there's um, questions with regards to that. And typical installation, as I mentioned previously, will take about 45 minutes and then they'll receive the handouts on how to read the water meters, which is what I had shown on a previous slide, plus the Water Smart customer portal, which is one of the reasons um, that this program was selected was in order to be able to provide customers with more information on their water usage. This portal will allow customers who want to engage in things like being notified if their uh, usage is higher than normal or if they might be, um, you know, based on their current usage, approaching um, a, a bill that's higher. But they get to set those notifications um, based on their own interest in monitoring. Um, they'll be able to look at historical billing information, they'll be able to get alerts and notifications that they choose and in the method that they choose, whether it be an email, a voice, or a text. Um, they'll also be provided with information on ways to save money if they wanted to reduce their water bill. And like I said, they'll be able to set the threshold notifications. So. I have one. <clears throat> so when you do the transition, what's the impact on the water bill? <laughs> so they're mechanical meters, they, they slow down over time. A 27 year old meter is not going to be registering the same volume of water that a new meter will. They do lose accuracy over the time period. I cannot say by what percentage. Um, do you want to add more to that, Mark, based on uh, what, if you have any particular meter testing data? No, uh, I would just address it from the other standpoint. So if we replace your meter uh, mid-billing cycle, on your next bill, you're going to see your old meter data, your replacement volume, so that will be factored in, okay. plus the, you know, whatever the incremental volume from the new meter is. So they'll, we'll capture all the water use up to the day of the replacement, and then we'll start again. So you're going to get kind of one combined bill once that happens. In, in residents potentially could actually see an increase in their bill only because their meter now is capturing the actual water flow. Correct. Uh, it, the bulk of our meters are in the 27 year age. So what happens is just corrosion and uh, <coughs> you know, internal mechanisms tend to slow down a little bit. Yep. So they may actually see an increase in water use just based on that if they have a very good meter. Uh, Mr. Schultz. Yeah, just a quick question. I understand the, the install will take 45 minutes. Just so we can let the okay. residents know, how much of a time window will they be given? Like we'll be here between what and what? It will be given a two hour time slot. And 45 minutes is, um, is a long end estimate. Under normal conditions, um, it should be you know, within a half hour. Mr. Masseri. Uh, Mark, I, I would, I suspect that some percentage of the meters that are out there the install is going to be 45 minutes. There's going to be issues. Whether it's a turnoff valve or plumbing or something that goes wrong. So how is that addressed? So there will be, and, and Greg could probably address this better than I because he's more a field guy than I am, but obviously we go out and people have, we get calls on a weekly basis. There are plumbers in the house. He shut the valve before the meter off. Now he's gone to open it up and it's broken in the closed position. Um, we're going to evaluate those on a case-by-case -case basis. Greg has a lot of experience looking at that the valve has a red and a white handle on it. I'm not touching it. Um, as you can imagine, some valves from the, the 90s are more likely to break than maybe something that was made in the 1950s that was made to a just a better standard. So we're going to have to evaluate yeah. those. Um, I, I, bring, I bring that up because that's exactly what happened to me when I was doing some work in the house and I shut the valve yeah. and it was a gate valve and it was in the middle of the winter and it wouldn't turn back on and the DPW 
did service, but where they thought the pipe was, was on one side of the driveway, and it was really in the middle of the lawn on the other side, and, it, and the shutoff was in the middle of the lawn. I mean, you know, that's the way the house was built. Yeah. Uh, so it took quite a while uh, to find it and shut it off so that I could replace the valve. Yeah, I, I'd like to say that situation does not exist in North Reading, but it does. It exists in every, every mm -hmm. community. So there, will be, there will be ones that when they show up, they're going to say, I'm not touching that valve inside the house because it's going to break. And the water department may not be available to come out and shut okay, it off. Okay, so then they coordinate that with the water department to make sure there's some emergency backup if something doesn't work. Right. Yeah. Our, okay. our, goal is, our goal is if we tell you the water's going to be we're going to do it in 45 minutes and there's going to be a 15 minute window that the water's off we're not looking to have you without water going into that evening so mm -hmm. there may be ones we say look we're just going to have to they're going to have to coordinate with the water department and they come back okay and uh, replace it just so people know and we get this question a lot we own the water meters that are in the home we own that there's a what we call a meter horn that the meter sets in we do not own the piping before the meter so we own to the shutoff valve outside by the street. Beyond that, the homeowner owns the service. They own that shutoff valve before the meter. So if that's a broken valve, that's the homeowner's responsibility. We don't want it. We don't want to be the people responsible who we've shut it and now it's broken in a closed position. So there may, will be those situations we have to deal with. Thank you. Just as a follow up to that, so if there is a problem with the meter, no, excuse me, with the shutoff inside the house before the meter, like in my house, there is one there. Um, I'm responsible for that. Will a homeowner be uh, expected to have a plumber fix that before the meter is replaced? I mean, there's really two ways to deal with it. One is the water department can come shut you off at the shutoff out at the street. They can replace the meter. We can turn the water on back at the street. You've still got a problem with your valve. If you ever have a problem in your house, you're going to need to address that. Okay. Um, the other option would be to just require the homeowner to do the, the plumbing upgrade before we come in and do the, the meter repair. The other uh, question I have is uh, from a monitoring standpoint here at Town Hall, if someone's away in this uh, a water leak at someone's home, will that provide us the technology now to be aware of that, whereas now we don't? Yes. So to speak to the, Margaret mentioned the granularity. We bill in units of thousands of gallons. As the water department, kind of the, the second meter to the right is what's in about 80% of the homes. It's the one with that black box. The black box is on the outside of the home. We can only read those to the closest thousand gallons from the outside. So if your home's using uh, 200 gallons a day, for us, every fifth day, there would be a blip in your water usage if we were reading it every day. The newest meters, the one that's closest to us, is what we're actually going to install. We can read that to the closest tenth of a gallon. So that's 10,000 times more resolution than we have with the older meters. The other thing we're going to be getting is we're going to be getting hourly reads on that meter. So whereas we're reading it every 91 days now, we go out and manually read those meters, we're getting 2,000 plus times more meter readings from your meter. So what this will actually allow us to do, and part of what Margaret mentioned, the water smart at the end, it'll actually allow you as a homeowner to say, alert me, there's technology in that meter head that says, divides the day up into 96 15 minute intervals. And if so many consecutive of those 15 minute intervals have actual positive water use in them, the meter will notify us and it can notify you through this water smart that we suspect based on that usage that there's, there's water use in your home. So it'll look at it if it's 3.6 gallons and then it's 4.2 gallons and then it's 5.7 gallons. It'll keep track of that, and if there's so many consecutive 15-minute periods, it's saying, this isn't normal, and it, it'll give us a notification if you're away, but it'll also have you through your smartphone or through your tablet. You can actually get that same notification that and, there's, there's water. And I'll just add to that that it does set it as to minor leaks versus major leaks. So you will get be able to get a report that says major leak, which is the situation where you're trying to prevent property damage, where minor leak may just be the the flusher valve is, is stuck open. So just to kind of compare. Uh, I think I'd rather have you get notified than me get notified. But, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, you know, truly, because you know, I mean, I'm not into, you know, unless something's leaking, I'm not cognizant of it and haven't had a problem in 30 years, but it doesn't mean I won't. 
but my question really was, you know, if there is an anomaly, you know, with my personal meter in my home, town will see something. There'll be some sort of an alert. It, there is a system in there to flag that and notify both the town and if the homeowner requests notification. Right. Now, if you're away, we need access to your home to figure out what's going on. Anything that's registered on that meter is obviously on the home side of the, uh, the meter. If it's leaking on the street side, it's not going to show up on right. that meter because that water hasn't passed through the meter. Mr. Masseri. Mark, uh, I think when we talked about this a while ago, is one of the benefits of going to you know, communications direct from the meter is that unlike now in the winter time, some of the meters don't get read in the quarterly cycle and therefore it has impact and we've gotten complaints from some customers regarding pushing them into the next level uh, of the water bill. This will be eliminated, correct? Is, is so again, we're going to be getting hopefully 24 readings every day from your home without leaving town hall. Okay. So we should be, if we if we set it at quarterly billing and we say we want to do it every 91 and a quarter days, you know, we could literally get down to that that limit of uh, accuracy with one okay. to read the meters. Generally yeah. people pick, you know, July 1st, I want the meter reading and they may allow a day before or a day after. So, but that's when we read all the meters in town. Now, the transition is going to be a little <coughs> A little difficult as we do that. It takes us six weeks now to read the whole town, so we're going to have to work to get to that. What is the day we bill on? Kind of uh, through that first couple cycles. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Good. It's great that we got the background checks in there for the people that are going to our, our residents' homes. I'm sure there'll be some comfort to that. And it's so wonderful that the police department's going to be aware as well. So. But the key is cooperation for people. And we do need the public to support the effort and uh, are we able to mandate people allowing us to do it I, I mean we, there'll be some people who will be resistant to I mean it will be something that we probably have to come back to you to address but yes in your bylaws it does say that you guys have the right to um, replace the equipment that you own that's probably a question for the legal counsel all right. Thank you very much. All right. Next. Are those free samples, by the way? I'm only kidding. Trash recycling collection contract. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, through you, this is a continuation of a discussion that we had at the second meeting in December. Uh, I know that there's been work done by the Department of Public Works to try to come up with a framework for a procurement package to review here this evening with the board so we get a better idea of some of the options that we might be able to get some pricing on. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we put a, a draft of the presentation in the meeting packet for this evening, but the Public Works Director will go through it here as, as well and facilitate the discussion. And I know that Ms. McGrath is also here on behalf of the Recycling Committee. Ms. McGrath, thank you again for being here this evening. I will turn it over to the Public Works Director. Before you do that, is there, um, what's your goal with us tonight? You need a decision from us this evening. So I think, and I, again, I'll turn it over to the Public Works Director, but I, I think that the goal is to get some level of tolerance as to what changes we would be willing to consider so that when we put the procurement package out there, we kind of have reasonable parameters with which to come back to you with a recommendation. And you have a timeline when you want to get this done? We, we do. Do you so need an answer tonight? Uh, I think that we would like some initial guidance this evening, if, if possible. Um, and if, uh, if it turns out that we can't get there, then we can't get there. But I think to the extent that we can, it would be beneficial for us, yes. Just trying to look at, you know, it's quarter of 10. We have a few more things on the agenda that are pretty lengthy as well. So I don't want to rush anybody. But please do the I best we can. <coughs> if we, hit, we can't come up to a clear direction, then we may have to have you come back. Not a problem. Um, it is, it is actually short. Um, so as uh, the town administrator had mentioned, this is really just to, to highlight the options for, for the proposal to create the RFP. It really doesn't tie, even, even, if, even when we put this out, um, it really doesn't tie us to anything specifically um, because of the way we can manage or negotiate a um, solid waste and recycling collection contract. Um, 
So the RFP configuration has six solid waste options, five recycling options, and then we separated out some of the ancillary stuff, for, for lack of a better word, um, the bulk waste, the televisions, the yard waste, and the municipal dumpsters. Um, in addition to the, it was added in a, a recycling fee, which we not something we see currently in our contract due to the, the change in the recycling environment. Um, most, almost all uh, vendors are try, uh, putting a recycling fee out there. So it, that was also broken out. And this was kind of done in an option to maybe almost set up an a la carte type setup that gives us a lot of flexibility in, in identifying which other ways we want to go and then for, with further negotiation with a, with a potential vendor, um, hopefully come to a, a plan that works for the, the town of Reading. Um, so these are the solid waste collection options. Um, this includes exactly what we have uh, today, collection and transport to our, our contracted disposal site, which is Covanta. Um, as you can see, option one is essentially what, what you have today. Um, we have Tuesday only collection, our two 35 gallon uh, barrel collection, and this is strictly solid waste. We'll, we'll cover the recycling in a minute. Um, and then we kind of took that option and just started changing that option and, and working it towards some of the, the options that are out there. Um, the second option is a manual weekly collection of uh, the same 235 gallons. And then we moved into the automated options um, utilizing the variety of different carts. A, 30, a 235 cart, a, 165 cart and 196 cart, and then and then we option E was an automated weekly collection and providing the variable option to, to home households to choose a certain size cart um, based on their usage. Different rates, so the homeowner could be charged at a different rate. Correct. If I want correct. 96. I'm charged only then somebody to 35. Right, and, then, and so there would be, depending on how we go on all of these, there would have to be some discussion or, or there would have to be a look at, at, the, um, at, the, at the fee and the rate structure and how, how mm -hmm. that shapes out. No, but that's great because I brought up before, we don't have any real options for our seniors, but this could have potentially give us one. Right. A um, couple of notes to just on the solid waste side, and, and, and by all means, if, um, if there's something I'm missing here. Um, couple of things we need to we need to determine the funding portion for the carts whether that's purchased through the vendor or purchased outright by the town um, all the automated solid waste options inc would include some sort of pay as you throw option for overflow um, in order to address the overflow the impact uh, to the trash fee as you as the chairman had mentioned um, we'd have to look at how <coughs> the potential um, costs would impact the current fee and, and how that structure would work, particularly with the variable rate um, collections. Current car costs, this is just off of um, OSD's, uh, the, the state contract. This is current car costs. Um, this is just for one car, so obviously if we went the 235 gallon carts, it would be, it would be twice that, uh, that cost. And, um, most likely, you, depending on what you do on the 96 gallon and 65 gallon, whether you go with one or two, um, those costs could increase also. <coughs> yep. all, um, oh, I'm sorry, you got to have to come to the microphone. You're, uh, you're welcome to sit up here if you want. I'm good here. Um, the, I just wanted to point out the DEP on the cart costs, there's money available. Um, not for the 96, they're not going to give you any money. 35 gallon carts, it ranges from 10 to $30 per cart, going from the 64 down to the 35. So um, in Bedford, we were looking at a 64 gallon cart for recycling, they were offering us $10 a cart. We are, we're similar, about 4,500 homes there, so it's about $45,000 to the cost of the, acquiring the carts. So that's, that's one of the funding possibilities, depending on what size cart is opted for. Thank you. 
Um, so, un so under the recycling options, um, this would include obviously collection and then transport to the vendor's location of choice, um, whether it's their facility or a facility they separately contract with. Um, the recycling processing fee will be separated out as, as its own item um, to, to help streamline the, the proposal so we can compare apples to apples. Um, first option under, under number three is manual option on Tuesday, which is essentially what we have today in North Reading, the 18 gallon bin that's, that's currently used, collected only on Tuesdays. Um, the next option would be moving to a weekly collection, still manual collection with the same 18 gallon bin or the customer provided bins that, that people also use um, once they pick up stickers from, from DPW. When you say weekly, that means it could be any day. There'll be different neighborhoods be assigned different days of the week. Correct. It'll be Monday through Friday or, or possibly a Monday through Thursday schedule and the town will be broken up accordingly. Okay. And that's that's the same situation with any weekly collection. It's, it won't be one specific day. It'll be a four or five day collection week. Um, option 3B and C and D all move to the automated type collection. Um, that's every one, every other week, sorry. Um, so every other week for option 3B it, with the 96 gallon recycle cart, and then um, in every other week with a 96 gallon recycle cart with an, a potential overflow of 35 gallon carts for a portion of the households. Um, for those individuals, for those households that, that tend to have a larger recycling, um, that would be an option option on those. And, and we can, you know, rework that whether it's uh, you know a larger bin, a, a larger number of households, or, or something like that. But we just looking at some of the other um, similar communities that that's thousand households and things somewhat similar. Um, option three D is the automated weekly of a one ninety six gallon car. Um, so. Kind of moving to, to some of the other ancillary things would be the bulk waste collection, um, moving that to possibly a one week a month collection um, and getting those scheduled separately in addition to um, a similar collection process with TV and electronics. Um, and then, uh, which is not much different than, than kind of what's in place now. And then um, collection of the solid waste, which is essentially the dumpsters from all the municipal buildings. Um, and then the, the last item would be the item that would cover the yard waste collection. Um, the initial intent would be to continue the, the same collections that we're using now, which I believe is two in the spring and two in the fall, um, and, and uh, have that available to residents still. Right. A couple of the, the points to point out. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, the, the trash collection and, and recycling collection is not covered under Chapter 30, 30B. Um, so there is some ability through the through a, a RFP process. Um, we can actually work with a, a, a vendor and negotiate once we uh, have a better handle on which way we're kind of going. And we can actually have some flexibility with, with the program and, and do some, some other things with the vendor depending on how the town wants to go. Um, uh, the town and the vendor can consider more than one option over the life of the agreement. So whether it's, you know, we stay manual for the, for the, for the next year and then transition to an automated version, uh, those options can, can, can be worked in also. Um, that's essentially the, the roll up of kind of how we're skinning this cat, for lack of a better word. Mr. Messieri. When, when you talk about the automatic and, and you had the three sizes, right, does that sort of suggest that you can only have one barrel of any kind? In other words, you couldn't have two. So depending on which option, and so there's a couple of different options there. There's, there's the option that does allow um, an additional, there's a 96 gallon option with a with an additional 35 gallon for overflow. 
On the trash side, if we went with the one, if someone went with the one barrel, then it would be a, the overflow would be considered a pay as you throw option. So each, each automated version under the trash collect, under the solid waste collection would allow for a, for a, an over, pay as you throw overthrow. Uh, overflow, sorry. Well, I, I was referring specifically to trash. Yep. And there were three sizes, right? And my question was, could you have more than one? Could you pay for more than one? Will the, uh, will the trash company pick up more than one? Or is it one pickup per household with a variable different size as so the bins? As the way it's laid out right now, the only one that would have two trash barrels would be two thirty five gallon carts. Anything over that you would you would have to pay for an overflow. Okay. Um, if we went with the one sixty five gallon cart, the overflow you would pay for your overflow on that because it'd only be one cart. And the overflow is always the smaller of the containers, is that what you were the overflow would be a, a page you throw bag. Oh a bag. Okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. So today we have People could put two thirty-five gallons out there, which Correct. is 70, 70 gallons, obviously. So the option potentially you go to a sixty-five gallon, pretty much the same, right? Correct. Okay. Go ahead. Well, no, but if you're putting out one thirty-five gallon trash and one thirty-five gallon in recycles, how would sixty-five? No, no, we're just we're together. just talking about trash. We're just talking about trash, not recycling. Today for trash. You allow two 35 gallon barrels for trash only. Correct. So, recycling, it's unlimited. You put out whatever, as much as you want. So, under this scenario that's being proposed, you pick one of these for trash, you pick one of these for recycling. I personally like the single stream idea a lot. And I think I like having an option for the folks to decide what they want. All three sizes. But you only get one for trash, and you only get one for recycling. Right. Maybe a little more work on our so, part, but you got to allow the public to have a choice. So, so just to clarify, um, so yeah, there is only one on solid waste. There is an option under recycling for, if you look under 3C, for those households that are high recycle users mm -hmm. to increase their collection with an additional 35-gallon over. So there are, there's the potential for households to have a 96 and a 35 <coughs> on recycling on the recycling side. Mr. Jones, I I, I like in, in concept the each household can pick what size they want for the trash, but I got a feeling we're going to be paying a premium to have a three tier. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it worth even? I don't, is there? Do we have that those numbers yet with the cost on that? No. So it, that's kind of we, we kind of gotta get this out there to, to to get those numbers in place, and at least that gives us the basis to work with a vendor to to start negotiating because we're not held to a a, a thirty b type bid. It allows us, you know, if there's two or three vendors that are interested in providing, you know, that type of service, then we can sit down with them and turn around and say, hey. You know, this is what we'd like to do. Well, the problem is, I I personally like the the, the homeowner can pick what size they want, but I want to see what the price of that is versus the price of well, we all have the same before I can make an educated decision what the best one is. I mean, we could make it a little bit simpler though. Today we only get seventy gallons for trash, so we just rule out the ninety six altogether, and that's going to be yeah. a savings right there, right? So at least at least it's an even. We're not hurting any resident in town because they're getting. They're only losing a gallon, essentially, under that scenario. Five and then, gallons. Five gallons. Five gallons. Sorry. Five <laughs> gallons. Thank you. That's <laughs> tired. It was a late night last night. Thanks. But you be later to tonight, one. too. I, I think. Uh, <laughs> but so we, we just eliminate that one to try to pick away here, try to get down to something. So you do one 65-gallon for trash, and then you in remote, by the way, have the electronic pickup. The cart, sorry, the cart, and then now we really all we have to do is focus on recycling. And would Which the board be objective to that? Yes, Mr. Mister. So, so Michael, let's assume that the amount of trash, the weight, the total weight, for the for the purpose of this discussion, doesn't change. 
and we go to the three barrel system, right? Which <coughs> you seem to be in support of because no, no, two. I'm only I'm only in support no, of no, no. But let me finish. I'm sorry. So that uh, uh, the elderly in town that may have a little bit of trash can pay less. At the same time, those that need more, right, need to pay more. But the bottom line is the amount of weight that goes out has to be fully funded. So it has some impact on what the rates are going to be. Yep. Right? And therefore, I think you need to get an understanding of what the rate numbers are for all of the like, systems like proposed <laughs> before you <laughs> nail it down. I know he's trying to. Okay, but I what you this is. But to here's the problem. Shorten the list. I understand. But here's, they have to give bid numbers, okay? And if we give them three options. Well, it's going to be a high price. Right? If you just rule out the 96, you're going to reduce your cost right there, which we don't offer that today. So you, why would we want to increase what we're doing already? Because someone's willing to pay for it. I just well, that, I that's the problem. That's really maybe, not the way it's yeah. going to work. We're all going to end up paying for it because that 96 <laughs> is going to get spread across the board. Right. So eliminate it. So let's. What we want to do. The goal should be is let's not harm the residents as it is today. Today they're getting six. They're getting 70 gallons. We're going to make a slight reduction to 65, and they're going to have one barrel to do it. I think that's pretty fair because, you know, things are going up. Okay. You, you add in, you bring in this 65, and this 96 gallons is going to make costs go up no matter what. I think we should just debate it right now and rule it out. I'd like to propose that we just rule it out. And then you just focus on the 65 and the 35. I just think we can't really... Yeah, we're gonna, well, we have to see both options. Like, so you got the two options on one E, yep. the, the two lower ones, which is fine, and you have one C. But I got a feeling we're gonna be paying a huge premium to be able to give the homeowner the opportunity to get the lower barrel. That's what I'd like to see those numbers. Yes. Okay. Just to this, we're talking about this. I'm gonna remind the board of that survey that was done a couple of years ago. It was 92% of the households put out two barrels or less a week for trash. Yep. It was, say, 5%, and all the numbers were three barrels, and the rest were four barrels or more, and it came to a total of 195 homes. Just trying to get the scale of what we're talking here. So I think if you put, whether you go to the 35 gallon or you go to 164 gallon, which might be given some of the streets might be more prudent than having two barrels at the end of a driveway on some of these streets. You know, I think at 64, you're going to be serving over 90% of the households in the town. Are we doing 64 or 65? Bags, I see two different numbers. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just saying, if oh. we do this, if we, I'm just here talking about the size of the barrel. Yes, I know. I'm trying Six, to understand. 64 you gallons, numbers. to what your point, is about what the equivalent of what we're doing today. Right. And that satisfies 92% of the homes. Yep. Right? And so I'm just saying, I just want to get the, the scale when you start talking. We're not talking half the town is going to, is yeah. going to need extra. Yeah, I cut you off for a second. Mr. Gilberto, did you want to say something? I, just to clarify, I believe it's 64 gallons. Not yeah, 65 it, there's, gallons. There's, a, there's a typo. We have 65 and 64. So that's well, it's too late. So now, it's, so now it's six gallons. So, 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 so that increment is six. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. Listen, we're all going to have to feel the pinch. There's, there's not much we can do here. But to continue on this path, I, is there any objection on the board's part to just rule out the 90, is it 95 or 96 gallon? It is 96. Okay. You have any objection to that? We got to give them some direction. Yeah, no, not at this time. I don't. You know, and, and again, I don't know what the we, we have a what the incremental cost is difference is, but as far as uh, as far as if we have a ninety-six gallon cart, the amount of trash that's going to be disposed of is going to be the same amount, correct? Well, I, don't, I, I think people expand to their existence, so you would tend to get more people filling. Well, I think you're people have the same amount of trash. I think the way right. you can do it, instead of them stomping around like the Chilean grapes, the wine makers, <laughs> they're going to just throw it in there softly. So, I mean, it's the same amount of same bag of trash. Yeah, but that's not the way the RP is going to work. When they go to bid it, they're going to bid with some assumption that you're going to have a lot of those 96s, and we're going to get charged for it. Yeah, but we're going to get paid on the weight. 
but the thing but is, you know, managed, you know, you know, but, but, but to, to Andrew's point, you know, I mean, some people stuff their barrels, and others just, you know, I have a couple of bags that I throw in there, so I don't have to stuff it anymore. But I mean, we know, we know what how much tr trash we've been generating over the last few years. Has there been much deviation other than the recycling efforts, which have paid off a little bit? I mean, truly. We're generating about the same amount all the time. So, so historically, if you look at the um, recycling and the trash um, disposal tonnages, um, the rates have decreased. They, they've kind of flattened out over the last couple of years, um, but there's been a, a, it's been trending in the downward direction. Over the last, I think, three years, it's actually flattened out and started to creep back up on the trash side. Um, so, I mean, clearly the intent is. Uh, one of the, the larger intents is to incentivize recycling. Um, and we would be, uh, as it's been indicated, we would be increasing the, the trash collection, we would be increasing the trash disposal that we would, we would be allowed to collect by adding the 96 car. Um, Mrs. Helper. One thing, if, if you have um, the automated 65-gallon uh, cart, uh, you also have the option, do you not, of having a page to throw a uh, bag in case you need that extra gallon, that like five gallons here. Correct. Right. Right. And, and the other uh, question I would have concerns the 96 gallons. Um, and does that, are we at risk of taking away from our recycling? Yes. Um, if you have a 96 gallon, it's just out there, come on guys, throw everything I'm with you. Yeah. I, uh, I think you have the risk with the 60, 64 gallon one also, quite frankly. You know, if you've got 90% of the household using two barrels or less, you know, I, I think you're going to give them the two barrel equivalent. What is the, if you have two, three, No, what, but if we can now allow households to decide if they want a 65 gallon, 165, that's fine. Then the seniors could pick 135. They're going to get charged less than I am if I take 65 or 64. Sorry. I don't see 135 gallon there, but is that something you'll be adding? If, if you look at the one E option, <coughs> that would be a variable car, oh. so that would allow households. <coughs> okay. And that's that would. That's one of the goals I was trying to leave to you, is to, to see if we could find a solution for the seniors. To, to, to me, that, that it would be one automated weekly 35 gallon with the option of the 35. Say for my household right now, I go, I put out one barrel a week. I only need one 35 gallon. And when I look up and down my street, well, a couple of my neighbors need to borrow my other one, I guess. But the rest of them, it's one barrel for the most part I, I with the recycling. So. You know, and I, again, I don't see that option otherwise, but I mean, one with the option of the extra. Um, have but the problem one is you buy them, and once you yeah, buy them, that's what you're getting billed. But what, what, one, you know, the option of one barrel, and I think that then and there provides an opportunity for the low users, uh, which includes the seniors, the opportunity to pay less than the people who opt into two, you know, or an optional one. This has been your help. So why don't you just make one E the automatic weekly variable, just 35 and 64, and take the 96 off. Can we run the numbers both ways on one E? Right. Maybe there's not much of a price no. difference. I'll tell you. But I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the, um, the I'm talking about the, whether it be the automated or the manual. One 35 gallon so instead of the this, two. That's why I'm saying if you go with the, the two, which is the 64 and the 35, you can make that determination on your own. So if you feel like your house school can live with the 135, 
then that's what you go to. And then you just buy the extra bags for to have on standby if you go over. And then for me, where I have a lot more trash than you, I'll elect to get the 64. And, and that's it. Then I'm going to get billed for 64. You're going to get billed for 35. Today, you're getting billed. For, we're getting no, no. billed for both. <coughs> right. And you're not. You're not yeah, I'm paying the same price. Why can't we run that over three ways? Because what? Nine, run no it one two uses ways. It. Pretty much nobody uses 96. Why are we wasting our. Yo, so, so back to the chairman's original question. Yeah, I don't have a problem with eliminating the 96. Yeah, I, I just By don't think you want to run that right. I, I Why not run the numbers okay? We all <laughs> go with it. Mike, see, I don't see have a yeah, Sorry. I don't have a problem with the 96 either. Yeah. Okay, but now you're going let's, back. Let's, 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 all right, we're going to help narrow it down. We're backing into it. Yes, in. Mr. McGrath. So the size of the barrel, the issue with the 96 is how much trash you're generating. It's the cost. Your the cost of the '96 is going to increase at Covanta. That's where the cost comes up. The cost of the truck going around town, regardless if it's a '96 or a '64, is pretty much going to be the same. They might, you know, that that's you you mentioned. You'll know, get a figure for '96. The cost is going to be Covanta. Yeah, but how do they bid it? Explain to us the bid process. So if I'm going to put in, you're going to submit an RFP, and I'm going to give you a bid. They, they, they have want to, to know, do something. I want to know right now what we're looking for tonight. Do you want to do you want to go multiple days? Yes or no? Or stay one day a week? That's going to that is. I don't going know to what the cost the, differential is. Hold on, hold on. But that's going to affect the bid. I'm sure. As I said last, so what's your I think recommendation? I said it the last time I was here, <laughs> that there are companies, the major companies, waste management, Casella for two local companies, will not bother to submit a proposal for a single day collection. Them. So what, what's the cost differential? And again, you know, people don't like change, okay? So they're used to the yeah, Tuesdays, and, um, and, and I'm not opposed to changing it. But what really are we talking about from a cost differential standpoint of allowing them to come four or five days a week, you know, I, I it, you know or require them to come the one day a week? You know, do I want to pay a premium for the surety of... Everybody knows when trash day is. You know, I don't. So, so I mean, you know, but, but we need to know, or I'd like to know what that premium is, you know, because the cost differential may not be that significant. And if it is, yeah, then we go the other way. Well, can't we just, I think that's what they're looking for us to say. Would, option one would be one day a week the manual collection. Option two would be one day a week the automatic collection. Option three would be one day a week the automated. Option four would be whatever you, you want to put the, they're asking us to direct them to put the bid out okay. that way with the various options. But I think we need to tell them, can we live with either or or see, we need to know what the price is out to be able to make an answer for that. And that's what they're asking us to give them the Give them the ability to put it on as different options. Right. So, so the uh, through you, Chairman, the um, the intent is to kind of get some additional guidance. We can actually keep all these options and put them all out um, and, and get the numbers and see where they where they shake out. Um, it, there's not a whole lot of harm in that, other than maybe some vendors being somewhat frustrated with us. Um, but it, I mean, ideally, we'd like to pare it down to. To what what makes sense initially? If, if something's really up, not not going to be considered, then it'd be ideally it'd be nice to get it off the table. Let me, if I could ask you a question though on that before sure. I lose track of it. So you said something, Mr. McGrath, that I'm going to make sure you, if you could just verify this again. You're saying today, if we put out the bid a one day a week, there's less contractors willing today to do that. <laughs> that right? I, I'm just speaking from my experience. In Bedford, two years ago, a gentleman from Waste Management came to us and said, if you stay in a single day, we quote, we will not waste our time writing a proposal or your time reading it. And, and if another company, Casella, we approached them, and he said, I know some of these people personally, and I gave them all the stuff, and we got radio silence coming back. Never got, never got anything. So to me, I hear that. And I do love the privilege of having a single day, but I don't think the economics of doing that is going to be viable for us. It, just because you're not going to have enough competition. Yeah. Okay. Every household will have a single day. It's just not going to necessarily be. It's going to be variable. It's going to be the same day every week, though. I don't know about that. No, each household has so, the same day every week. 
So, so, so yeah, can so it? It's just, yeah. If the Monday, one day, one, you know, one day it's going to be a, one part of town will be Monday, right. the other part of town will be Tuesday. Like so, like oh, every week they're going to have okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty good. Yeah. That's yeah. better than I thought, Mrs. Minupel. I have two. And then Mr. Missy. On the, I think it was on your previous slide or the slide that talked about the extra bag. The pay yep. Throw, right. So this pay as you throw would only be for. I don't understand how it would be for automated. If there's an automated card, how are they going to then retrieve a so, bag? So if we go to if the town goes to an automated option, um, people are restricted to whatever they can stuff into that car. You know whether they jump up and down on it or, or not. Um, once they're finished jumping up and down on it, and they can't get anything else in it, and they still have additional trash, the only other option would be for them to do for for the town to provide a pay as you throw bag. For additional waste. But then who's collecting that? Same company. There's an additional cost, obviously. Right. They'll get out of the truck for that. Hence the reason pay as you throw. And then the second, my second question is if you are putting it out there for the, all these alternative options, somebody could still respond to the ones that they want to respond to and not respond to the manual, you know, one day a week. Yeah. What, right. what have you. So that we'd still get a sense of what the board needs to know in terms of the right. price differential that if you put all these different options out there. And if manual isn't available or no one comes back with a bid on manual, then that's fine too. We have to move on to the next alternative automatically. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and, <coughs> and we would expect that there would be only one, probably I mean, only one, one take around the manual. Yeah. Mr. Masseri, you had a question. The, the move to uh, doing it over the course of a week is to reduce the number of vehicles dedicated to doing the North Reading trash pickup. Is that kind of where they're going with this? Correct. And that, from a business point of view, I could see where you know, if they lose a, lose a particular customer, they may have trucks sitting in the garage and people idled in a one-week thing. I mean, in a one-day thing, where in a week, you know, they can make that adjustment a lot easier. Right. And then if they have a truck problem, you know, they could have one spare for the entire environment and still get the job done, so. Mr. Schultz. Uh, just a couple of things. I don't think, uh, and I'm speaking for myself, I don't, as long as people have a dedicated trash day, I think you could have it, you know, five days a week or whatever, each part of the town is a different trash day. I would think doing it that day, that way would also help with some of the delays we have where trash doesn't get picked up on like cold days, snow days, what have you, because if they got less of an area and they got extra trucks probably available. That makes sense? It would definitely allow flexibility when we when we bump up against the issue with um, Covanta um, being over, you know, two hour and three hour waits. Um, it also allows a lot more flexibility as you indicate um, if there is a snow day or a storm day one, you're only talking a small area of town. You're not talking the entire town itself. So, so for them to flex and, and, and address an entire town because of one storm as compared to one route or one-fifth of the town, um, it'd be a, a lot easier for them to address that. And, and, yeah, and I just want to clarify, when, when we talk weekly, it is a set day all the time. It is not a variable day, rotating day, or anything like that. Um, that would... Never ever ever, ever work. <laughs> you just guess. Let's go. One question: Are we paying a premium now for manual? I would think that automated would be less expensive than manual. That be a good assumption. Uh, well, I think we're we're paying a probably a pretty good rate base because um, we are still under a, a a contract from five years ago. The um, what we're seeing on initial quotes for the manual collection on the one day only is we would, it would be a premium. Um, there's no doubt about it. And at, at this point, we can only, there's only one vendor that, that we know that even would provide that quote. So I just want to bring us back to the survey that you mentioned, because it was valuable data. And where you have 92%, I thought it was said more like 95% was two barrels or less. I think we really should focus our attention around that. You know, we can't we can't come up with a solution that's going to make everybody happy. There's just no way. We, we went through that painstaking conversation last time we went through this. And 
So I would ask, urge the board to let, try to narrow this down. Let's not send them out of here with this wide variety of an RFP. <coughs> Let's give them some direction with a narrow view. And it seems like the support of the board right now seems to, the majority of the board supports the idea of having a multi-day pickup where a section of town will have an identified date for that section, which I do like that. And can we at least check that one off that we would be in agreement on that? Check that one off. Good? So okay. That eliminates option one. That, that's correct. <coughs> one is gone. Get rid of one B and D. Okay. So just a, for you, Chairman, just wanted to clarify, it, it would be our desire to keep option one in there, at least, if nothing else, for a comparison purpose to see to see where that. See, the, the only one we eliminated and you want to keep it in. <laughs> I, you know? <laughs> We're just trying to make this our yeah. little, I think, I'm just concerned about the bids you get. Yeah. You may get less bids, you may get less <coughs> people interested. More bids means cheaper price. Less bids, it's not going to work out in the best interest of the town. So I think you're taking a risk by doing it. But you're a lot smarter at this than I am. I mean, I only bought billion dollar planes for a living years ago. Now, this is trash. <laughs> this is trash. <laughs> okay. All right. So if that's what you want to do, but at least you got the the board is at least in agreement that we like the idea of having the multi day option to be considered in the RFP. Now it comes down to the barrels. And we're still on trash. We haven't got the recycling yet. Is there still a strong opinion the 96 gallon should be part of the equation? I know I'm against it. You know, it would appear that if we had the 96 gallon in the equation, the bids are going to reflect those being full. That's right. Which would be a negative. Right. Uh, Can we get the bid with the 96 one up to 96? Look, I, mean, I think there are people that are going to be upset when they're losing six gallons of trash. I mean, why not at least see what the bids look like? If it's if it's a huge price difference, we're not going well, to do it, but we should at least explore but it. But to me, I think if we've got 90, 92 percent of the, the households are two or less, those that need the 96 can buy the extra I'm bag. I'm not saying I'm for the 96. No, 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 no. But I said buy the extra bag. That's not how it works. Or, or that could be the variable. I don't know. That's not going to be. If you're a bidder, a bidder's going to look at this and they're going to make an assumption how many people may acquire that 96 gallon cart. And that's going to get spread across the cost. That's going to be your problem. To right. satisfy what? Yeah. 10 households? Yeah, 12 see households? What that cost is. You may be very, absolutely right, but why can't they bid it with 35 and 64 and then give a second bid with all three? I mean, yeah. Why not see the numbers? That's all I'm saying. Because you haven't, maybe you haven't, have you built RFPs before? I mean, have you bid on RFPs before? That's what's practice. No, seriously, I'm, I'm oh. being honest with you. I have it, but I'm telling you, somebody that's options. done multiple bids, yeah. this is not the way the thought philosophy is when you uh -huh. bid. You're making assumptions that are going to have a negative effect on that 35 and that 64 gallon. I'm promising you that. Okay, but if you want to, if you, the majority, I, I'm fully against what you want to do right there. But if the majority wants to, numbers, to make and I think you're going to make the rest of the numbers look bad by doing that, taking that approach. But Why make it look better? Well, what the pricing to the Residents differ depending upon which barrel it will, being. but so they have to make an assumption. They're going to assume that we would charge, we would charge more, so but they're going to have to make an assumption. How many you, be, you wouldn't necessarily be subsidizing them with the, the people using 35 to 64? Uh, so, so, the way we would work is if you're bidding on this, and you're gonna, they're not going to look at this and say, okay, 196 barrel, 196 gallon barrel is X. They're going to make an assumption how many households in the town will get that. Yeah, they're just going to, because that's how they're going to have to do it. They're not going to base it on one household. Are we going to have a tipping fee that will be turned up to what we actually use? Or is that, is that, is that over and above this? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that question. Are we, well, we're paying the, the trash collector for the amount of trash they're picking up. And then a tipping fee at the at where we're disposing of it. You're paying a tipping fee at the disposal facility. You are paying the collector only to pick up the car. If that had five gallons of material in it or 20 gallons of material, but when they put their bid together, they're going to assume a 96 gallon car is going to have 96 gallons of trash, give or take, because that's how they have to they have to account for their trips to Covanta. Um, for 4,400 households. 
Jones. That's right. And on our survey, the survey you did before, I mean, you said 90% were two or less. Do we have any idea how many were actually one? You know, was no, it 60%? I, know, I, I, I mean, was it like 60% yeah. of the households? Or? All right, how about this? That would be. What if we wrote the RFP to say, assume that 92% 92, 92 of the town is going to have a 65 gallon or less barrel, and that not 8% is going to have the 96. I mean, they're going to have to narrow their bid somehow, because if not, they're going to expand it. Gonna, they're they're, they're, they're going to look at their, they're yeah, they're going to, right. I mean, it's the way they're going to bid it. They're not, but they're not in business I, I think it's important if we can extract that information as far as really how many households were of that 90% were single barrels, you know. So if that comes that that comes back at sixty five percent of our customer base did is a single barrel. Single? Yeah, I think he said he did. You know, then yeah, you know then that's important data because now we're saying okay, you're going to have sixty five percent or whatever the number is, and if it's high enough, I mean, you can put that. In the if it's high enough, then you then you say okay, we're going to reduce it from what we did three barrels. We're going to reduce it down to one barrel or from two to one, and people pay the extra. You know, and again, that way there we have a more clearly defined usage, and we're not going to be paying on an assumed higher rate of trash than we're really a tonnage that we're not really delivering. Because so, uh, we're Robert, supposed to be delivering a certain you, amount of trash too, right? No, we don't have a guarantee. You're missing something. The you, you're paying. You're going to go out and get a bid. And let's say you have a bid for the pickup, right? And it's a, yes, it's going to be based on a bunch of things, including the trips and so on and so forth. But we set the rate, and let's say that we have two barrels, the smaller and, and, and the double size, right? And what we're going to do is that's like, uh, you know, essentially uh, taking the rate based on the total number of barrels of 35 by saying if they're doubles, if they're buying doubles, then it's two times. And when you put it all together, and you say, this is the cost of dumping X number of pounds of uh, trash at uh, Aventa, then uh, you distribute it so that people that have one barrel are going to pay less, and people that have two barrels today will be paying more than they're currently paying, because right now everybody has a two-barrel limit, and those only using one are paying, Subsidies. they're paying for the other. No one's going to have two barrels on the like E. They're just going to have different size barrels. You can have one barrel, just no matter what size it's No, no, I understand that, okay. but the volume. Yeah. Right? Uh. So, you, you, so if you have the smaller barrel, right, you're going to, the people that get the small barrel are going to expect to pay less. Yeah. Right? Right. That's so what we want. That's what right now, everybody pays as if they're filling two barrels. Right. But what I mentioned earlier was that if you take the total weight that we deposit in a year and say it's not going to change, and that cost is an A or B, whatever, right? Then you take the Bob, barrel mixture Bob, that's and not the way you they're divide it, it into the volume and you end up with two barrel people paying twice as much as single barrel Mr. Masseri, they're not going to bid it that way. It's not going to be their thought it, it, process. It, it, so. Until it's, it's, it's sure quantified. Is. That it's portion of it is, Michael. Okay. Then the, you get it. The experts the are right there. You can ask them. Well, I think they should have the town data, what you just said before. They should have the survey data, what they Mr. Messier, I mean, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, again, Andrew and Ed, you know, look at 1E, all right? So 1E is one barrel, pick your size, right? How are they, they going to bid on that other than based on historically what we deliver for trash? I mean, they're going to say, okay, get the same number of stops. We don't care if it's a 96 or a, or a 35. doesn't matter, right? But the tonnage, the way they figure that is going to be based on Depends on what we buy here, that's going to be a factor. How many? Or they would then have to look at historically what do we deliver in the way of tonnage? Wouldn't that give us? Well, I think it, to your, one thing I would say is one of the issues is if you're doing 96, how quickly is the truck reaching capacity? And do they have to leave town, drive to Haverhill to unload, yeah, but, and but, get back? And, but we know that it's not, because it's not that many. Well, no. If, no. if you put 96 gallon carts out, yeah, so I don't think anybody's talking about doing that, but there are some households that may want to buy into a 96 car, right. you know, which would be less than 10% of the people, based upon what people have been putting out in the surveys that you've yeah, done. Yeah. But I'm is there saying, a risk? I think the issue from the hauler is, is how quickly is my truck going to fill up? We just went through this 
two weeks ago, New Year's, the week of New Year's, with the cold and the snow, these, there was more a volume of trash was oh, yeah. up. They had to get up to Pavanta and they get hung up at. Right, but that's an that's an annual no, occurrence. So they're count, the they're week after play, Christmas, oh, Mr. McGrath, will more they trash. It, will they take risk into account on that? Yeah. Well, it's going to affect all the other rates for a 35 gallon and a 65 gallon. So, so I, it, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. If I can fill my truck up, if I only if I'm only dealing with 35 and 64 gallon trucks, and I can do my route once I get come into town, do my route and go go to Cavanta, and I'm done with North Reading for that day. It's different than having to drive to Covent and then come that's back. That's the point I've been trying there. to make. But this isn't going to lessen the amount of trash that we have as a town. Right. That's my point. Like was Mr. Larry just said, people are going to have the same amount of trash. It's going to take them the same amount of time to do one neighbor as it does now. It's not like it's going to be any less because the size of You're still going to have the one senior citizen with one bag or one barrel. you got other people with two. Or, you know, like right now, everything jammed in. It's still This truck has still got the same amount of trash on each street. Nobody's debating that. It's how they bid it is the issue. It's a strategy. That's what an RFP is for. It gives them the tool they need. They're going to read it, and they're going to bid to it. And if you want to throw the 96 in there, you're going to affect the price of the overall bid. They've said it. That's what but, I've heard from But if we're going to tell them, but if we're going to limit the number of 96 barrels that are available, then that helps <laughs> reduce the risk. Yeah. I, I don't know how you do that. Well, I think, what did they have? Uh, you had one up there where you had a thousand households or something. Right. It's, so it, there's, you could look at that option and consider um, something along the lines of making, you know, less than 10% of the households um, have 96 barrels, similar, similar to the, um, sorry, sorry. Right, right. That's what, that other way you had a thousand. Yeah, so similar to the way the 3C is set up for the recycling. Um, right. Is an additional option to pick up an, an additional thousand households, and that could be actually separated out as a separate a separate item, so it doesn't impact a specific item's cost, because clearly that will drive that cost up. If they know they have to pick up a second barrel at a thousand households, or whatever that number is. Okay. All right. So you have enough now to build the RFP for that. I wouldn't say no. so. Just one more point. Okay. You know, every other week on recycling, or keep recycling weekly. I like weekly. Yeah. Weekly. I, think I, I would say weekly. What do you recommend? I think I personally weekly. I think it's convenience. Is it, if you're, I think you show every other week. You run into the issue of is, is this my week? You know, if we were saying, is this my? You know, right. then we start. We see these cities. With the calendars and the green, you're a green week, you're a yellow week. Well, we had week. that here, right? Didn't we have that here for a short time? Well, we did. Well, we did. And what about single stream? Do you People stop single stream, yes. Yeah. Recyclables back. Is everybody on the board in agreement with the single stream? I think if you're going to do, if you're going to go every other week on that, I think you're no. just going to get more in the trash. But Right. That's why I don't think anybody's in agreement with every other week. Yeah. But he's asking about single stream. I'm, I'm fair. Single I'm stream is just throw everything in the same London. bucket. That's it. And it would be the same day as the trash pickup to recycling, right? Yeah. Even if we go yep. multiple kind. Yeah. Okay? Yes. So eliminate on this three B and three C? Correct. That's coming out. And what are we eliminating on the next one? On the one before this actually. Not that you're getting it all because Andrew wants it in there. No, you're eliminating B and D. It's gonna cost every tax. How big are our green things right now? A month. What size are those? B and D. Uh, What's what? You're eliminating one, one B, and one D. Those are 18. Those are 18. We're talking one bid for a customer. The current, the current recycling bin is an 18 gallon recycling bin. They're allowed to put out as many bins as they desire, or they can use a a barrel with a sticker on it at any size they want. There's no limit on recycling choices. No limit on recycling. So, Ed, you said you needed more information. So, well, one, one question I had was, um, are we still talking the 96-gallon car on recycling? No. I'm not. I'm no. But no. I think they, I don't know. You said recycling? On um, recycling, yes. Wait. Oh, recycling? Yeah, recycling. Recycling, yes. Recycling, yes. All right. But on the trash, I, I'm a no, but 
I think the majority wants to see it in there. Why are we Why are we doing 96 gallon out of recycling? For recycling, you're going to want the larger part because cardboard, yeah. cardboard, you get, they're going to have to put stuff into that car, get the cardboard boxes to fit in. You're going to need the space. Yeah, so today, Steve, you could take cardboard and just kind of lean it up against your. Your, uh, yeah, I fold it up though and put but it now, in. Now, yeah, right, right, right now I cut it up and right now I cut it up and put it in the green bins. How big are the green bins now? 18. You go by my house today, I got boxes stacked up next to it with recycling on it and they pick it up. Yeah. But I won't be able to do that anymore. I'm going to cut everything up and get it into that one barrel. Tomorrow I'm putting out the cardboard boxes. There'll be some, a lot of utility. It's all cardboard. Yeah, good paper, yeah. That's the difference. If you, if you look at a lot of the residences, at least for, from what we see on our windshield surveys, um, the majority of residents are using something in addition to the regular ATL. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're using, either using a second one or they're using a, an additional trash barrel. A recycle barrel, sorry. Or they're actually using a box and filling that box up with all recycling, right? Which you won't be able to do anymore. Mrs. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hilver, I, I'm sorry I passed over you like seven times. No, 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 it's fine. No, I agree. I, 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 I just want to rule it out. But Can I put two up? Okay, top five. Okay, we're good. We're good at what? I don't know. Are we all set? Do the best you can with it, because I'm telling you, I think I've lost everybody on this one. We're good. This was helpful. All right. You got this. Thank you. Thank you. Either way. All right, anybody want to go get breakfast and come back? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, can we do the next one? Is the director of public, public safety presentation? I just have to use the men's room while you queue up the presentation. If you, I'm not back yet, please continue, and Mrs. Minupelli can take over. What did we just direct them to do? What did we direct them to look at? slide that we put on here relative to um, the discussion, um, why uh, thought the discussion was relevant now. Um, looking ahead, we foresee growth in our public safety needs, um, some of it associated with substance abuse, some of it associated with population growth and the demographic change that we've discussed, particularly with our other services director, and also the impact of our projected and desired commercial growth. Also, we 
see transition in multiple fire department positions or will see transition in multiple fire department positions, transition in inspectional services departments, and increasing expectations placed upon our emergency management programs. Further, um, the sustainability of our fire department staffing approach, right now as the community is well aware, we're, we rely heavily on a callback system to provide for our first alarm response. And that's something that we're continuing to evaluate as the department again becomes busier and busier. Civilian dispatch, the potential to consolidate dispatch as civilian um, operated, freeing up existing police and fire personnel to address growth related needs. Um, additionally, we've had some feedback relative to the town administrator evaluating delegating responsibilities. Um, so from my perspective, that's something that I've heard from the board members that we give in each of my evaluations. Um, and the reason the timeliness is important is because the budget recommendation process is underway now between the finance director and I and the involved departments, and uh, so the more guidance we have earlier on in the process, the better. So a little bit about the town charter, which creates for divisions. Uh, the administrative functions of town government are the, divided into an organizational framework that consists of four divisions. Division of Finance, a Division of Public Works, a Division of Public Safety, and a Division of Public Service. And under the Charter, Section 412, the selectmen may designate the divisions to be headed by a director, or by the town administrator, or by a board comprised of members serving without compensation. And if a director position is appointed, is, is created, it, that appointment is made by the town administrator, as is the case if it's a volunteer board as well. Uh, so just a little bit of language about the area that we're talking about here this evening, public safety, the administrative responsibility for the protection of persons, property, and property including the functions of police, fire, emergency management, public health, sealing of weights and measures, health and safety inspection, and other such public safety services are vested in uh, the director or supervisory board of the Division of Public Safety. So this is just a slide that I pulled that's actually up on the town website that shows the divisions <coughs> Uh, of uh, the town government per the charter, and you can see that uh, there are five elected, four elected boards, I should say, and the town moderator, uh, just up at the top here, school committee, planning commission, selectmen, housing authority, and the moderator appoints the finance committee. And sort of showing through here, you can see the, town, uh, the delegation down from the selectmen to the town administrator and the division of the existing departments into the various divisions. So this is kind of how things are outlined if you take the strict interpretation of the charter. This is the uh, delegation that's effectively, uh, that is in effect today, and uh, I'll just note that the division of departments is only classified and headed by a division head in two categories, public works and finance. Public works director having uh, been up at the podium before, the finance director here this evening. You see that there's multiple divisions or departments within each division here. The rest are individual department heads uh, that are within divisions but are reporting directly to the town administrator. So just a breakdown here of the current table of organization for the Division of Public Safety as it exists today, headed by the town administrator with a direct report by the police chief, fire chief, emergency management director, building inspector, and health director. This is a notation that I put in here relative to the existing staffing in the public safety departments per the charter. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but you see that there's a certainly a significant amount of staffing in the fire and police departments, and as you go through the remainder, they're, they're much smaller in the staffing levels. Um, you have the 22 uniform individuals in the fire department plus the administrative assistant. The uh, 32 in the police department plus the administrative assistant and the one part-time director for emergency management with the staffing and the inspectional services departments on the right-hand side. So just identifying what a potential table of organization for those departments would look like if a director of public safety position were created. You see here the town administrator overseeing a public safety director who would oversee these same divisions police, fire, emergency management, building, and health. Just a note about dispatch as it exists today. It's currently a split model that's overseen by the police chief and the fire chief. Uh, 
uniformed police official answering the 911 calls, generally the supervisor, um, and a uniformed firefighter conducting triage or EMD and dispatching apparatus to the fire department. And there's a potential by looking at uh, public safety director um, with the potential to transition to a standalone public safety director. Um, excuse me, there's a, that's a duplication, it's incorrect. And with a standalone civilian dispatch, um, if we were to create a public safety director position, staffed by civilian non sworn personnel that could handle 911 dispatch and EMD. By doing so, we'd basically be able, to be able to take an existing police official position, make it available to go out and serve on the road in the community, and similarly make a fire, uniform firefighter available <coughs> to respond to calls. So I just put some notation here relative to the goals of creating this position of public safety director, establishing consistency of policies among the public safety departments where practical, creating a unified overall public safety command structure pursuant to the charter, allowing for planning for long-range public safety service structure, providing additional administrative support for transitioning departments, supporting or improving emergency management structure, and a fresh eyes perspective or opportunity for innovation led by a uniform public safety official or non-uniform public safety official to challenge or question the status quo. And I just put a slide on here relative to potential implementation options, which is, there's a range of them full-time standalone director of public safety, which would be similar to the uh, public works uh, department, uh, director of public works um, combined position, which we actually have an effect in the finance department, which is a combined finance director town account position, potential for a part-time standalone position, or potential for even contracted services. And those are the range that could potentially be considered um, for implementation. That basically the information that I want to provide the board this evening to start the discussion. And I think the feeling is for myself, as well as from the human resources director and the finance director, that uh, some initial guidance from the board at this stage will help inform our, our work towards a budget uh, preparation to be submitted to the board in February for consideration on March 3rd. Can we get the lights turned up just because it's this late? I'll stop falling asleep in this document. Thank you. Okay. Any feedback anybody want to provide to the town administrator? I just think as our population both ages, what the over 55 we have coming in, it grows. And I think our needs change, and I think this is in our charter for a reason. I think it's something that should be utilized. I just have a quick question. Have we, have, because it's in the chat, have we ever had a director of public safety? Uh, not to my knowledge. No. I think it's a good idea, too, because of all the transition that we are seeing <coughs> and have seen. Um, and to see actually, to see how the finance director is overseeing all those different departments, it, it sort of makes sense to have that similar circumstances with the uh, director of public safety. So all of those would come under that, you know, under the public safety director now. So all those different divisions would come under, under the public safety director. And I just think it's a good idea at this point where we've seen in those specific, we, where we have seen and where we're going to see such uh, personnel shift in those, in concentrated in those departments. I think just for continuity purposes and sort of moving forward, the way that we want to try to move forward and with everything else that's changing in the town, I also think it's a, it's a wise course. It's a wise, I think a wise, um, I think it's a, a good choice to, to have that now. Well, the one thing that stands out for me and something that We've talked about a lot since you've arrived here, Michael, is you know, your plate's pretty full on a daily basis. And you know, even in your own reviews, if you go back and review, see some of the comments that are made annually now in your review, there's one commonality, and that is just um, dispatching out some of your responsibilities, delegating 
some responsibilities to play a plate to be more the CEO of the town. I think this structure will allow you to as you take those five different areas and now put it under someone else and then they're reporting to you. It certainly gives you uh, an opportunity now to more focus as a CEO of the town versus trying to be our director of public safety. And I think there's a lot of efficiencies that can be created from that. So. I like the idea, and I know your concept isn't about singling out any individual department. This isn't about any one of these departments not running efficiently. I mean, the execution, I think our departments all are outstanding, A plus. It's capturing the future and how we go forward and find efficiencies and better ways to do our jobs within the funds that we have available. So I, I'm cer certainly bought in on the concept, and I and I love the idea. Anyone else? Yes. I just uh, I'd offer just a little bit of information that as well that I probably should have noted at the beginning. Uh, maybe I did when I read from the slides, but again, this is something that would require uh, action by the board um, to create such a position as required by the uh, by the charter. And uh, to the points that have been made, uh, it's not about any one particular. Uh, area. Um, we have talented individuals in each of the departments and leading each of the departments that are involved. But uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, something that could benefit all of us in terms of uh, the long-range planning that, uh, that we uh, need to be doing. So, thank you. Mr. Masseri, Mr. O'Leary, you have any input or not? Sure. Um, I don't uh, agree that there's a need at this particular time uh, for a public safety director. I mean, what we're talking about here, I mean, primarily it's, you know, police and fire department, which are the two largest areas that need to be uh, managed. I mean, emergency management is a part-time person. Uh, inspectional services, uh, you know, a building inspector and an assistant building inspector and part-time individuals. Weights and measures is a part-time, and you have a health director and a, an administrative assistant in the health department. So really what we're talking about is oversight, primarily for police and fire department. Uh, th there's no doubt that there's been some change and will be continue to be some changes in personnel um, under the public safety area, particularly in the fire department at this point. The chief wanted just retired. We have a new provisional chief, and that, with that comes some other promotional uh, opportunities. Um, but again, I think, you know, what's precipitated, a couple of things that precipitated the discussion as to, you know, what the needs really are. Um, you know, when we're talking about, we've been talking about civilian dispatch for a while, and that's uh, something that we should continue to discuss and, and investigate, but I don't think we need a public safety director to oversee it necessarily. Part of our concerns and problems really, if you look at the goals here, Consistency of policies among public safety departments. I don't see why we can't, and if they're inconsistent now, and again, I don't know that they are or they are not, um, I don't think we need a new position to ensure that there's consistency there. Um, unified overall public safety command structure, I think there's uh, very different uh, responsibilities when it comes to police and fire department. I mean, they, they have different roles that they play, they have different uh, uh, policies, procedures, and uh, guidelines that they follow, and are somewhat unique to each of those functions that they provide. So I, I don't know about the unifying the command structure. I don't, don't see the need. And again, as I look around to other communities, and don't, don't get me wrong, if we need to blaze a new trail, that's fine. But uh, I don't see an awful lot of other communities like-sized or um, with similar um, challenges buying into the same program. Um, additional administrative support, to me, I think that's part of what we, we're trying to address here. And it's not just at the department level, but it's particularly here at the town administrator level and in his office. And if we need some additional administrative support, if we want to be talking about a, an assistant town administrator to take off to take some of the responsibilities, um, not away, but uh, have them handled by somebody else, you know, that's a different type of position. Um, 
support and improve emergency management structure. I, I, I don't know, I guess I'm not clear as to what we need to, uh, to address there. In a fresh eyes perspective, I mean, I, I think what's driving this is, you know, the board has been very clear over the last couple of years in our instructions to the administration and in our efforts in negotiating contracts to bring about some meaningful changes and reforms, and we've been uh, very successful in doing so. Um, we've also had some difficulty in effectuating some of the changes that we'd like to see. I don't think that the creation of a public safety director um, necessarily uh, facilitates that. I don't think the cost associated with doing that is worth it. I think we could still effectuate the same changes that we need or would like to see with the current structure that we have. There's no doubt that it's going to take an awful lot of effort and time on the part of the administrator to do so. Uh, but uh, I, I just don't, I don't see the I don't see the need at this particular time based upon the rationale to do it. There's no doubt that the town administrator is a very busy guy and he does an excellent job and he needs some sort of assistance and relief to address all that's been put on his desk. Um, but I don't see this proposal as the, uh, the solution for that. In addition to that, you know, depending upon, uh, as we look at the, the different potential implementation options, you know, full-time standalone director of public safety is going to cost you what, $165,000 plus. Uh, probably uh, for the one position or combine the position with somebody else. If we combine the position with uh, uh, one of our existing chiefs, uh, for instance, potentially, you know, we have an employee that's going to be making in excess of $200,000 a year. I don't think we can justify that to the, uh, to the taxpayers. I don't think there's a position that's, that warrants that kind of a salary at this particular point in time. Part-time standalone position. I don't understand what a part-time, I mean, if the position is needed, it's not part-time. Um, and we're certainly not going to contract it out. Uh, so again, I, I, I think we can uh, bring about the necessary changes uh, that we're talking about, or we can bring about uh, some additional assistance, if that's what's needed, you know, by looking at other areas. And again, we've talked about it before, you know, should we be creating a, you know, assistant town, town administrator position or provide additional support staff at various departments in order to, uh, to lighten the workload off of some of our department heads and the town administrator? And to me, that's a, a more reasonable solution at this particular time. So I am not in favor of uh, directing our administration to expend an awful lot of time and effort and energy and resources to... Uh, to explore this option. So at one time in my tenure, I was looking at this very seriously. Things were nowhere near as well as they are today. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, uh, I think that To go forward with this, if you ask me to, let me put it this way, if you ask me to vote in, uh, to do this tonight, I would say no. But I'm looking at this as move, a, move forward enough to at least get a complete picture of what we should do, what it's going to cost. And I think I, I can be fair enough to say, I want to see what this whole thing is going to cost and how it projects going forward and what issues it's going to create as we go forward because of the what I think in order to fill the position and looking at the salaries and the costs and everything, I think we have to look at that very carefully before we make any final decision. So I'm not suggesting that we we stop this town administrator from, you know, moving forward a little bit, getting a little more focused on a on a real plan and a real cost. Right. At, at which point, then I'm willing to take a position A and A. But at this point, uh, I, I don't think 
think uh, I'm willing to say stop the process. But I'm in no position to say yay if you wanted to say let's do it right now and this is how we're going to do it. Not without looking at the entire picture and fully understanding the implications. That's where I am. Uh, I mean, the town administrator is bringing this forward. He wasn't asked by us to bring it forward. It was something he wanted to do. He, when you look at his responsibilities on a daily basis, it's pretty overwhelming where he's at. So um, he wouldn't be putting this forward if he didn't need it. So he would know better what he needs to get his job done, and I would hate to question him on that. And we certainly should have questions, but I don't think we should derail him from this opportunity if that's what he wants to take. We should help him try to find the best path to do it, and I think if we give him the opportunity at least give them a, you know, a hint tonight that, or a decision tonight that the majority of the boards are going to be in favor of it. So he can go back and we'll come back to us at our next meeting and tell us how he's going to pay for it. And give you some of the answers you're looking for, Mr. area. But I think it's important that we go back and you look at that overall organizational structure the way it is today. It's overwhelmingly everything runs through him right now. And some of this stuff is very important, especially Civilian dispatch, we've been talking about it since I arrived here eight years ago. And that's never going to get off the table because uh, we, we keep talking about it. Until you have somebody championing it, it's not going to get done. So I don't know if there was a, if you were looking for a motion tonight from us. So what is it you were looking from us tonight to do? And then what's the next step? And, and I have other one other question I need you to answer with that too. So there's three questions. And the third one is, um, is this thing forever? Is this something you want to keep in place forever? Is it a permanent position that you wanted to have? What's your thought on that? So I'll try to take them in order, I guess. <clears throat> I did put a motion in the package and uh, put a note on the agenda working with you, Mr. Chairman, relative to the vote that I thought would, which was appropriate, which was to direct the town administrator to present an implementation plan for the position of director of public safety. And the thinking was that if there was an affirmative vote by the board to do so, I would work with the finance director to create a, a budget recommendation that, uh, that included and reflected that and submitted to the board. Um, the timing uh, as such is uh, it would probably bring us right close to our next meeting um, when we'll be looking to submit budgets, but uh, you know, that, that, it, that, that time is running right up about the time we'll be submitting the entirety of the budget as well. So it may or may not be for that evening. In terms of the, uh, the, the, the permanence to the, uh, to the position, uh, I consider it to be no different than really everything else that we look at in the budget. The finance director and the department heads will tell you that we go through every departmental budget submission every year and scrutinize uh, the requests that are in there. And, and this would be no different. It was something that we would look at and evaluate on an ongoing basis and make a recommendation no different than I have in other areas in the past based on the need um, and based on, on where we stand. Did I answer all your questions? You did. That was great. Thank you. <coughs> I had a quick question, but I just, I just think taking this opportunity now, uh, I don't feel pressured to do so, but I think it's a, it's a good time and it's a good opportunity to do so. And I, I, I equate it similar to the recommendation of have a an HR director. We had this lengthy discussion about the HR director. I think, I think, I think I would agree with uh, the chairman that there. Is, I, I don't agree that you're overwhelmed, but I do. I, I do think there's an awful lot on your plate. And there's an awful lot that you do do. That you know. There's a lot more that you do. That's more in the way of, for lack of a better word, triage versus effectuating your mission for the town. And, and I think we hear a lot of these issues, management and personnel issues and things like that. And I'd like to free up some of your ability to, to move forward with your mission for the town. You know, obviously consistent with the board's mission. But I also think I'd like to hear from you on, if this is something we voted on to, you know, have you further this evening, what is your recommendation with respect to which option you think would best suit what you see for this position and, 
And if we did so, do you have an idea of funding, or do we have, you know, do we have money to pay someone to do this? So uh, I think that the answer will ultimately, through you, Mr. Chairman, I think that the answer will ultimately come uh, as the finance director and I move through the budget process and identify available resources um, or projected available resources for next year's budget come the time to make the recommendation. So that's kind of a framework that we're working within. I think that, you know, looking at the scenarios, I think it would be fantastic if we were able to identify a standalone director position to serve in that capacity. Uh, but I, I think that um, it's, it's going to be challenging financially for us to do so. So the, the, the scenario I see that's more likely to, to, to succeed is the second one, which is a combined position, very similar to the finance director's position. Uh, with responsibilities. What we need to look at in doing that is what is the implication relative to um, you know, overall in doing so. And that's something that the finance director and I have to look at with the department heads uh, involved to, to recommend for implementation. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, the cost, uh, you know, I, I'm not, not prepared to, to, to go into detail on that right now, only because I think that there still are some things that we need to look at in terms of the, implica the implication. Mr. O'Leary, you have a question. Yeah, it, it, your answer to his question obviously um, heads us into the second option, which is probably the most realistic option if you were going to implement something, which is to combine the position, as you stated. Um, it, to, to me, and again, I'm not on the financial planning team uh, this year, as Mr. Masseri and I were last year, but you know, my guess is that this particular juncture, you know, level services budgets for both the um, school department and Town government are probably somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million dollars in a deficit situation as we sit here today. And as we talk about um, creating, or we're well, not creating, but actually uh, yeah, creating a new position, you know, whether it be combined with another one and with an additional stipend or, or, or not, um, you know, to me, my priorities may be elsewhere or are elsewhere. Um, first of all, closing the gap and maintaining level services is extremely important. Uh, not only town government, general government side, but in, in the school department. Um, and again, if we look at, uh, you can't help but look at the potential, potential positions which would be combined in order to do that, uh, we're left with particularly, particularly basically one option. And with that option, and again, um, the salary level doesn't make sense for the town of North Reading. Doesn't make sense. Um, and, and as far as it you know, being looked at on an annual basis, as to we, once you put it in, it's very difficult to have expectations that it's not going to remain there. I, I, I've been here a long time, and I can't think of too many positions that have actually been uh, eliminated. Uh, and again, when we did the finance director uh, position, and Mr. Dow was here, uh, you know, that was, again, for continuity, consistency, and really harnessing and putting all, all the uh, financial functions under one, one director with an additional stipend for that one position. But at the time, you know, and again, even today, uh, this is worth our weight in gold, uh, you know, we didn't have to take a quantum leap in order to effectuate uh, the change, and it became, you know, the efficiencies were there. Again, to me, I think, uh, the ultimate responsibility still lies with the town administrator in relation to it overseeing public safety and all the other departments. That's the way the charters, charter is written. Uh, it does provide this tool. Uh, prior boards have never seriously entertained doing it because there have been other communities which tried this option and abandoned it, such as Linfield, used to have a public safety director. Um, didn't work. You look at Reading, you look at Wilmington, you look at Andover, you look at all the surrounding communities. Show me, a, show me a community that has a public safety director. They may have additional support and administrative staff for their mayor or for their town administrator or for their town uh, manager or for their police chief or fire chief. They don't have public safety directors because, again, the, um, the responsibilities for the primary departments are different. And uh, I, I don't think we need to... Uh, hide behind a badge in order to effectuate the changes that we think are needed. Again, it's going to be a long, long painful process maybe to get all the changes that we, we feel need to be implemented, but
but that's not going to change whether there's a public safety director here or not. All it's going to do is allow for it to end up in that person's desk prior to it eventually ending up in the town administrator's desk anyway. The ultimate responsibility and decision-making process still lies with the town administrator. Uh, I just think uh, priority-wise, dollars and cents-wise, salary-wise, uh, I think uh, we'd be making a mistake. And I'm not in favor of it. And I, again, I think uh, from the fire department standpoint, we're in a transitional stage. If we believe that there are some issues there, let's address it with the new administration that's going to be there. Uh, police department, I don't know that we have the issues. I don't think that our concerns and our issues have been clearly articulated to, uh, to justify the position. Anybody else? If not, I'll take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to direct the town administrator to present an implementation plan for the position of Director of Public Safety. Second. A motion and a second. Any more discussion? All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Abstaining. 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 Okay. The record shows three, one, and one. Write that down. Okay. Appointment, Board of Appeals. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to place the nomination of following names for appointment as associate member of the Board of Appeals for a term to expire on December uh, 31, 2020. Uh, there's two openings. Uh, and I would nominate Matthew D'Angelo and William Bellavance. Second. Yeah. Motion to second. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I would ask that the, um, didn't we have more applicants? Yeah, do you want me to read them all? Yeah, they all, they all have to be put into, okay. they all have to be put into. Ma Matthew D'Angelo, Laura Matola, Clancy Main, Stephen Wechty, Amit Subrami. Mark D. Simone and William Bellavance. So we have to do a roll call? Yeah. And I'm recommending Mr. D'Angelo and Mr. Bellavance. And do we have is this recommendation based upon discussions with the, uh, the chair? Yes, and I reached out to every one of the applicants, spoke to the ones who either I spoke with or returned my call, and did speak with the chair at length as well. And the recommendation of the uh, chair and other members of the Board of Appeals was? Uh, the chair did not know any of the other applicants. Uh, he had concerns on Mr. Bellavance because the fact that he's on other related committees. We did receive a uh, opinion from the town council who said it was not a conflict. Uh, Mr. Bellavance, frankly, was the, by far the most qualified of the seven applicants. Um, Mr. D'Angelo, who I also recommended um, as a background engineering, I think would be a good fit for the ZBA as well. Um, yeah, and the chair and I, the only applicant we really knew what well, we knew with Mr. DeSimone and doing Mr. Bellavance we didn't know the other five applicants but I did reach out to everybody any more questions just a uh, comment uh, and uh, as far as uh, Mr. Bellavance terrific fellow he's a wonderful guy and he's a good public servant and uh, putting in an awful lot of time as a member of the Community Planning Commission, as a liaison from the Planning Commission. Uh, he comes to the Secondary School Building Committee meetings. He goes to the Board of Appeals meetings. He's been to a whole bunch of other meetings and putting in an awful lot of time. Uh, my concern with, with, with Bill, and it's, it's not has anything, anything to do with his qualifications, background, or anything else, is that he does sit on the Community Planning Commission. Uh, the Board of Appeals role is to act as a pressure relief valve for uh, determinations made by uh, whether it be the building inspector and in some instances the community planning commission so that applicants members of this community uh, if they feel as though they want to appeal a decision get to appeal to the board of appeals in Mr. in mr bellavance's role as a member of the community planning commission um, it has been the cpc's practice uh, of late to render an opinion and offer that opinion to the Board of Appeals prior to their hearings and determinations. My concern is is that if he's going to sit in as an associate member or sit in as a member of the Board of Appeals, a voting member of the Board of Appeals in the absence of a, a uh, full member, he will have already often potentially have already offered an opinion on an issue that's going to come before him, which does not necessarily provide 
uh, a fair hearing for the applicant. I think it's not that he going to make a good, bad, or indifferent decision. Again, from what I've seen so far, uh, I admire Bill and I appreciate his, his public service and, and I voted for him for the Planning Commission and I would vote for him again if they want to continue to serve there. Uh, but I think there's, well, there's no ethical conflict of interest from a legal standpoint. I think where the conflicts could arise is the fact that an appeal of the CPC and actually, a lot of the matters, most matters that go before the Board of Appeals already has a recommendation from the Community Planning Commission. So that he would be predisposed to have already rendered an opinion prior to it, any applicant getting a hearing. The most important part to understand is that any decision of the Board of Appeals has to be unanimous. And in his capacity as a member of the Planning Commission, he will have already come to a conclusion on many of the issues that are already coming before them. So I, I think it, uh, and again, I like his service on the CPC. I just can't in good conscience sit here and, and put him on the Board of Appeals where he may have to render a decision on something that they've already decided on and has already rendered an opinion. So I think in, order, in fairness to the public and the applicants, you know, he probably shouldn't, shouldn't serve there unless he doesn't want to be on the CPC anymore. Uh, again, prior to his being on the Planning Commission, um, again, I was liaison to the uh, Board of Appeals for, I don't know, dozens of years uh, uh, up until this, this year. And the chairman and I of the, had talked about approaching Mr. Bellavance to be a member of the uh, Board of Appeals. Uh, but then once he got on the Planning Commission, we both believe that there was an inherent uh, potential conflict of interest that wouldn't provide a fair, a potentially a fair hearing uh, for an applicant coming before uh, the Board of Appeals and it just didn't fit well. Again, Bill is a great public servant, terrific guy. I admire him, I uh, appreciate his public service, but I, I can't, uh, can't vote to put him on the, on the Board of Appeals. And we have a motion, we have a second, any more discussion? Just, um, no? We'll do a roll call. Oh, yes, go ahead. But, but di isn't that the subject matter, the conflict issue, that was the subject matter of the opinion town council gave that there, there was no conflict? Yeah. The, There's no conflict of Mr. Bellavats sitting on both right. boards necessarily, but I don't believe, and again, I'd have to defer to the town administrator as to actually what was asked of council in relation to the conflict issue. I, I don't know the specific question that was asked of him. They would be supported. Through you, Mr. Chairman, we asked a general question relative to the ability to legally serve in both offices. And the opinion we got back from town council was that there was uh, no prohibition on serving in, in both, uh, both offices. And the feedback that Mr. Schultz received, or he's provided at least us tonight and before, He's gone through the list of all the members and he felt that these are the, his recommendation of the two best qualified members. If you have a personal issue with Mr. Bellavance, then no, you I don't have a personal issue with Mr. Bellavance at all. And, and that's okay. I do. You no, I do not. Right. No, Bill Bellavance is a wonderful public well, servant. You have an issue with him being on this particular board, which because is of his other right. position that he holds, right? It's your opinion of that, and I, you know, I just only knowing how the process but, works. But that one, the nice thing about this process is you don't have to vote for him. That's, that's what's nice. No, no, I know. That. No, that's fine. Okay. Right. No, right. but but I'm not going to not vote for him without an explanation as to why, you know, as much as I would like to, I don't think it. Well, it's wise. I think you've given a very yeah. extensive explanation, yeah. and I think it's a valid one. And from your perspective, I get it. Uh, but um, we've been, you know, we had this the last meeting. We pushed it off. We allowed more time, more vetting, and the opportunity to speak with the chairman of the. Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, I mean, I think we've done all we can do here. There's been a recommendation by a, a liaison. There's a motion, there's a second. If there's no more discussion, I'd like to have the roll call vote. And we'll stop just with Mr. Larry. Uh, we'll do a little more discussion just in relation to some of the other applicants. I mean, uh, I think some very good applicants that, uh, that we have here, particularly looking to Clancy, Maine. Uh, worked for the City of Boston City Council and sat in on uh, Board of Appeals hearings and sat in on hundreds of them. And uh, I don't know how that doesn't qualify him 
uh, for consideration and having some expertise as to how the process works. You know, part of what the uh, Board of Appeals needs to do is, you know, grant some relief where it can be granted uh, or to uphold the decision of the Building Inspector or Planning Commission, but also hopefully keep us out of court. Um, so we have a lot of other well-qualified people. In addition to that, we're always looking for people to, to volunteer. We have one, two, three, four, five, six people who currently do not serve in any capacity on any volunteer board committee or commission here. And Mr. Bellavance, again, putting in an inordinate amount of time, which I'm extremely grateful for. Um, we're always looking for good qualified people to get involved, and here we are excluding some other good, well-qualified candidates. Mr. Masseri, did you want to make a comment? I just wanted to uh, say, I, <clears throat> uh, Steve's comments regarding, uh, even though it's not a legal conflict, I think it's, it's important that we look at Mr. Bellavance's uh, position on the CPC, and the CPC makes decisions related to basically uh, <coughs> the people coming before construction together, whatever, and then, and also setting policies, and then things that uh, people looking for a permit disagree with, or people wanting to make changes, as said with the building inspector putting something up, they go to the planning commission, not the planning commission, the uh, board of appeals. So, you know, I think there's a problem here, and it's got nothing to do with Mr. Bellavance. It's got to do with anyone that was on this CPC wanting to be also on the Board of Appeals. Um, I know Mr. DeSimone. I don't know any of the other individuals, and I didn't know it was an issue, and I didn't try to contact them. So, when it comes to vote, I'm only going to vote for one one. Mrs. Minyakal. So is it, is it possible um, in here, and I did have those same considerations, not necessarily the same as Selectman O'Leary, because I think they're just, they're just totally distinct, um, and these are associate member positions, but is there the, uh, I know that I seconded the nominations, but is there the opportunity to get a more specific opinion with respect to the overlapping, if any, duties? Was that the context of the opinion? Because you said you just had a general question if, if there's an ethical conflict. Um, I will do through you, Mr. Chairman. Please. I mean, there's an opportunity to ask for in any particular scenario we wish to ask for. I mean, the, you know, the <coughs> at any point in time, I think any one of us have including myself, have seen the, you know, the situation where there may or may not be a conflict, depending upon the individual business that's before us for whatever purpose. But, um, you know, I, I think they certainly ask. But, again, the question was more general based upon the two roles and whether there was a prohibition on serving the two roles. Right, right. Mr. Schultz. I vetted everybody on this list. I reached out to every single person. Mr. Bellavance was by far the most qualified candidate we have for this position. We have an opinion from town council. I understand, Mr. Lear, your, your concern, and I understand your brother's concern is the same thing. However, I don't think no matter what town council comes back with an opinion, your opinion is going to change on this. So I don't see why we just don't put it to a vote tonight. Come on, take this count, can on the road. But Third or fourth I, I don't mean to be disrespectful yeah. to your, I, am, I appreciate yeah. that you're making the recommendation, and I, I'm just, you know. But we've already, we've already done okay. this. We got you. I, yeah. I'm not, don't need to yeah. be disrespectful no, no. again. I know him too, and everyone here knows. Because I, I think I understand Mr. O'Leary's objection, but I don't think your correct me or wrong. I don't think your opinion on whether you vote for him or not is going to change the one column of the piece. Says next week versus what they said last week. You have it because you, you even said I understand there's no legal ethical thing, but you feel there's a conflict from a different standpoint. Your opinion is not going to change on that, so I don't know what waiting a week is going to do there. Other than fully informing the other members of the board. The other thing is, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to uh, like to point out, you know, as I said, I was liaison for a number of years with the, uh, with the Board of Appeals, and until this appointment came up, I didn't realize that there was a, uh, an associate member's slot unfilled. I mean, otherwise it would have been filled 
a long time ago. I mean, this this one particular slot has been uh, uh, vacant for, I can tell you now, for a number of years. And I think it was just due to uh, the fact that, you know, as it comes up for renewal times, uh, it just fell through the cracks. It wasn't, uh, you know, administratively on, a, on our end here. Uh, fell through the cracks. Otherwise, you know, we would have interviewed, and again, we had a, a bevy of candidates before uh, also that were willing to serve. But we didn't realize, I didn't realize, as even as liaison, that there was a vacancy and we would have filled it. So uh, I don't think it's critical. Uh, and again, the, the Board of Appeals can function, you know, with, with one associate member being appointed this evening. And uh, again, if uh, the majority of the board is uh, truly intent on putting Mr. Bellavance on there. And again, he's a terrific fellow. But I think in order to make a, a well-informed decision, I think a, a more specific question should be asked of counsel. And if counsel has a different opinion than me, it wouldn't be the first time, you know. Uh, and it wouldn't be the only time that, you know, lawyers disagree on things either. You know, so I, I have no problem with, with having a different opinion. And, and you're probably right that my opinion in relation to, to voting for Mr. Bellavance isn't going to change because I understand how the systems work here in town in the town of North Reading under the bylaws, the zoning bylaws. Decisions of the CPC can be appealed to the Board of Appeals. The CPC renders an opinion to the Board of Appeals regularly on matters that go before them. And you know, you're an attorney. If you want to rep have someone represented, you want to represent someone before the Board of Appeals. Do you want a, someone sitting in on the hearing who's already made a, a judgment? on your application without being heard. We all serve on multiple boards. No, I, that's not the point. No, that's not, that's not the point. Council, People deserve a fair a hearing on the matters before them on a, on a board that has to have a unanimous right. decision. It can't be three to two. I mean, you know, two to one. It's a three-member board. It's getting late. I think everybody had an opportunity, a fair opportunity to vet and vent all your concerns and you know, I went through the list. I don't know anybody except for Mr. Bellavance. So for me, I have to rely on the liaison's recommendation, how I'm going to make my vote, only because I, I don't know the qualifications. Together. I've read all this stuff, but I have to go based on what my liaison's saying, and that's what I'm going to do. And I have been on this board a long time, and I've seen us have guys like Mr. Bellavance before us and many other. I mean, Mr. Carucci is a perfect example. The guy serves on probably four boards. I mean, when did we ever but, stop? But none of them are in you know, conflict. But the bottom line, Mr. O'Leary, I've given you an opportunity. I'm sorry, I apologize. Please. And I, I, we know your frustration with this particular subject, and I apologize that you're frustrated for it. But we have to move on. The liaison made a recommendation. The board doesn't have to agree with them. And we have an opportunity. We're going to do a roll call vote. I'd like you to start it off. If you don't want to, I'll select someone else to get the, the voting started. But I'd like to move and on if we can. The other members do not wish to have a, a, a clarifying opinion? Well, I... It's been clarified to me. I asked a question it, when he brought it forward, when I got the report back, in his capacity as an associate member, even though he's on the CPC, he has no conflict. That came back from counsel. They fully know what his job and roles and responsibility as an associate member on the ZBA, also being the primary board member of the CPC, they knew all about that. It was all fully disclosed, and the answer came back no conflict i don't know what more a council could do all they're going to do is just repeat exactly what there, there's no other way they, they asked a the question there's only one way to ask the question mr Masseri. michael generally associate members cannot vote this is an exception that's it? correct that's why we got legal counsel's opinion and legal i'm just asking the question legal counsel understood that that he could be a voting member yes on specific you know, on an occasion where there was, a, there was an absence. An absence. Yeah. I, I believe that the position of associate board of appeals member is a statutory position, so I'm fairly confident that he understood what the yeah. rule was. Yeah, clearly. So, again, I, I would like to just get the voting started. So, Mrs. Mrs. Minupelli, would you start us off? Uh, Mr. D'Angelo and Mr. Bellavance. Mr. Schultz. Mr. D'Angelo and Mr. Bellavance. Mr. Masseri. Mr. Mysteri? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Mr. DeSimone. And you're just picking one? Yes. Okay. Mr. O'Leary? Uh, Mr. D'Angelo and uh, Mr. Main. And the chair is going to vote Mr. Bellavance and Mr. D'Angelo. Right, let me make sure I got this right. You had, Steve, you had Mr. D'Angelo and Mr. Main? Yes. 
Bob, you had Mr. DeSimone? Yes. All right. Um, and we had, okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Off the Kenny Field. Mr. Chairman, through you, there's three actions required by the board this evening. The first is to vote to approve a payment requisition. Uh, this is a uh, approval for the uh, payment of a bill that's come in, and the, the bill has been certified by the architect to, to reflect work completed to date. The amount is $146,699. We have a motion in the packet. It does not make any change to the contractual amount of the project. There are, however, two change orders that will follow it. So how do you want to, do you want to go through everything first or just take on one at a time? first, please, because it's not okay. related to, this, to this, the second and third item. Uh, so requisition change order? Oh, well, if, if we just could, just quickly, Mr. O'Leary on um, the 146.699, everything's on track. No yep, issue. and, uh, and the uh, athletic facility subcommittee recommends. Thank you. So go right ahead. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve payment requisition number four in the amount of $146,699 to Construction Dynamics, Inc. Second. I have a motion, a second, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Next up, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve change order number two in the amount of $4,427.50 for the purpose of connecting existing on-site electrical utilities to the new building. Second. Excuse me, what was that number again? 4427.50. It's okay. not in the scan packet. It's only in front of. Because this oh. one says 7,505. Is that the second one? After today's another one. Yeah. Oh, okay. There, there, there were two. There were two uh, after today, there's a second change order, which is the first motion that was just made. Uh, okay. Because this one says for change order number two. You said that's for change order number two. Two. Yep. And but this says so change order number two. The that should be Mr. Three. Gilberto. The first one was change requisition number four. No. This motion is for change order number two. What's the next motion? Change order number three. Okay. Uh, so we're locks. Okay. So that's my. We flip them around. Yeah. We're not, I'm not using their numbers because we, we don't. A change order that didn't occur is not a change order. All right. They use number one as. Number I'm just going to disregard my packet. Is that yeah, probably I the best thing? I think that's the best approach, yes, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to shut that. Let me read that again for clarity. Please, go right He's got the updated. Yeah, the has the updated. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to approve change order number two in the amount of $4,427.50 for the purpose of connecting existing on-site electrical utilities to the new building. Second. I have a motion, a second. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. Just uh, I didn't quite hear what the uh, change order was for. Um, connecting existing on-site electrical utilities to the new building. Mr. O'Leary is going to give us a quick little update. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to the town administrator first, then I'll weigh in. Okay. <laughs> I'll take the initial round. Yeah, he'll be more calm about it. Though, but. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, through you, this is a change order that is required uh, to cover the cost both of disconnecting and reconnecting some of the existing electrical utilities in the vicinity of the concession and restroom stand, uh, the former concession, proposed concession and restroom <laughs> facility. Uh, these are utilities that provide electricity for the baseball scoreboard, the illuminated sign along Park Street, which has been dark, the uh, spotlight for the U uh, American flag, and the electricity to the baseball field ticket booth. So there's a series of uh, what I believe is all underground conduit that brings the electrical service to the location of the former concession stand. So um, they took it out, they took all of that out? So they disconnected the connection at that uh, the electrical connection at the stand and need to reconnect it in the new building once it is installed. And uh, due, to, um, due to an oversight in the drafting of the uh, procurement documents, that disconnecting and reconnecting was not included in the scope of work. And therefore, when the project was bid on, that work was not quoted in the bid. So this change order it, it addresses the additional cost changes the contract to account for that additional cost and ensures that the on-site utilities in and around that the new building are reconnected properly to the new modular building, which happens to be due for delivery on or about March 1st, March 1st. 2018. So, okay. Mr. O'Leary, anything else? Yes, it was with great uh, consternation and frustration that the uh, committee had to meet again this afternoon in order to discuss this because we have been looking for clarification for the last two months in relation to this specific issue. Uh, it was the uh, Athletic Facilities Subcommittee's opinion, and 
I think, valid opinion, you know, that when you disconnect one building and you leave all the conduits and wires there, the expectation is that it gets plugged back in. Uh, there is no doubt in anybody's mind on the subcommittee and Marty Tilton, who was there firsthand, along with Wayne Hardacre and everybody else and with the contractor, the electrical contractor, the general contractor, looking at the old uh, electrical box and what was hitched up to it as to what was there, what type of service was finally uh, resolved as to whether we needed more or not. Uh, there was no doubt that there were all these uh, ancillary uh, electrical uh, conduits connected to the old stack shack. Uh, and the expectation was that we got the new one, it would be reconnected. Uh, to the town administrator's uh, kind way of putting it, uh, you know, it was it was overlooked, apparently, uh, specifically overlooked. The specifics were overlooked in the bid documentation, and now we have uh, been presented with this this change order. There's no doubt we need to get it done, and we need to have it, uh, we need to pay for it, and we're responsible for it. And there's no doubt that if it were included in the original documents, we wouldn't even be sitting here talking about it. I personally don't believe that the, ex that the cost associated with it would have been any more than what we are paying would have been paying under the original contract. Uh, that being said, the Athletic Facilities Subcommittee recommends this. Very frustrated. Mr. Goberto. The good news. The strong position taken by the committee reduced the cost of this change order from what it initially was. That's by right. $100. That's right. I mean, we we, so we went back to the members. architect and uh, told her to have him sharpen his pencil and the original cost estimate to us was $1,100 more due to the Athletic Facility Subcommittee's insistence that there was a problem with this. Mr. Masseri. Uh, funds are available. Funds are still available. Um, if you <coughs> act favorably on this change order and the next one, we would have approximately, what, $6,000 left in uh, contingency? Yes. Okay. All right, we have a motion to second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. All right, we have one more. Mr. Chairman. By the way, just for the record, I voted no in the subcommittee, but I voted yes tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move to approve change order number three in the amount of $7,650 for the purpose of including a remotely controlled door lock system for the facility. Second. We have a motion. I have a second. Any discussion? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is a uh, proposal uh, that we feel we can fit in under the contingency in order to. Uh, bring about uh, more efficient uh, building and operations of the building again. This will, re will allow for laptop remote access uh, to the building, just like as we do with Town Hall here, we can lock and unlock the doors, uh, and if there's a problem, we can unlock it and get in there quickly, uh, remotely, as opposed to lock and key. Uh, and we think that uh, it would be a fine addition to the facility as far as the operations so that the um, recreation people wouldn't have to go down there or the school department wouldn't have to go down there at any given time because someone doesn't have a key or someone or some occurrence took place and they need immediate access we can do it remotely and it's uh, great to fit it's within nice the contingency technology. and again rather than coming back at a later date uh, if we weren't going to go for the full loan thing here we would probably be asking for uh, a lesser amount in order to put in the locking mechanism and door frames that could take it so that we could upgrade later on, but we think now is the appropriate time and most cost-effective way to, to implement it. Okay. Mr. Masseri has a question. Mr. Masseri, sorry, I didn't hey, see you. A question for you, Steve. So you said there was $6,000 after? After this. After this, in the contingency. Where are we with the percentage of completion such that a surprise isn't going to come Well, we were also- run out of money. You're right. Uh, Obviously, the, the Athletic Facilities Subcommittee is very cognizant of uh, where it is. Uh, we felt that the most uh, exposure that we had was on the site work itself. That's complete. Uh, the modular building is a modular building. It comes in, it gets dropped in. We pay an extra to have everything hitched back up as far as that goes. Uh, so uh, it doesn't appear as though the, the how could I put this, the uh, exposure to risk is minimal. And we're aware that the contingency, you know, is low. But again, what needs to be done is basically uh, the electrical is going to be taken care of, just tying in the sewerage, you know, which is one line, and then the uh, 
fencing and uh, landscaping and paving, landscaping, paint, you know. It's all part of the bid. All part of the bid. So that's all part of the bid and all laid out. If in the event that something came up that was in excess of the six thousand, how would that be handled back to town meeting? And I guess it depends on what it is. I, I think what we I don't anticipate that we will be coming back looking for additional funds. If if there is a requirement for additional funds, my guess is the athletic facility subcommittee would go back to our architect and our general contractor and look for them to help us out. Because I think. And we'll any other questions? Not all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Right. Minutes. Mr. January. Chairman, I move to approve the January 8, 2018 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the January 8, 2018 executive <coughs> session mi minutes as written. Didn't you already just do that? That was regular. This is executive oh. session. Second. Second. <laughs> yes, second. A motion and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any other ones? That's it. Okay. Set up the upcoming meeting. What date do I put on these? Today or the one in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Sign it quick. <laughs> yeah. Michael, uh, the upcoming meeting schedule? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Through you, we've put some information in the packet relative to the existing schedule as well as a recommendation for um, meetings beyond the set existing schedule. Uh, and I, without reading everything I put in there, we already have meetings set for Monday, February 12th and Monday, February 26th. We set the Saturday budget hearing for Saturday, March 3rd, and we had published a budget hearing schedule that included March 5th and March 19th, March 5th, March 19th, and April 2nd as budget hearing dates. And my recommendation to the board is to affirm that the board will meet on those dates, Monday, March 3rd, Monday, March, sorry, Saturday, March 3rd, which you've already done, Monday, March 5th, Monday, March 19th, and Monday, April 2nd. And then beyond that, due to the holiday, uh, the third week of April, <coughs> as well as where the budget process is likely to be at at that stage of uh, the schedule. The recommendation is that the next meeting be Monday, April 23rd, for a tentative budget hearing and capital presentation to occur. And then Monday, May 7th, would be the last day to sign the June town meeting warrant. So in the... Um, Excuse me, you talking 7, uh, 7 p.m.? What time are you talking <laughs> about the meeting times? Do we... And so the fifth, the nineteenth. So all of those have been right now. What are the March planning meetings? Planning on a planning on a six thirty start time that we've been working on. What are the March meetings again? The March meetings would be March fifth and March nineteenth, and it, it, that's in addition to the Saturday March third meeting we've already set. Okay. And that's not changed from what's in the uh, the budget schedule. The budget schedule. And then we set beyond that, we set a third or fourth hearing date for April 2nd, which will be the first Monday in April. And the third Monday in April is a state holiday. It's also the school vacation week. So my recommendation is we bump the meeting to April 23rd, one week later. That's April 2nd. Correct. And April 23rd? Yes, sir. So we'd go two weeks before we meet. Not three, almost three weeks. The 23rd is not on your list right? there, right? But we've had 23rd. in the past. Yes. Yeah, yeah, see, the second that I see is holiday. No, it, it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a departmental budget hearing. It'd be a regular Madam board Tuesday or Thursday. With any, result, any resulting budget action. Oh, okay. Place. Um. Sixteenth, a holiday, you say? It is Patriots Day. Mm. Oh, okay. Mm. So wouldn't it make more sense to do the ninth and the twenty third? You back in April, Michael? Yeah. Uh, we certainly could. I, it'll put us in a scenario of having back to back meetings on the second and ninth, but um, why do we have to have the second? It's a scheduled budget hearing date. With the FinCom, right? 
Yes, yeah. that's correct, with the finance committee. So when we publish the initial budget hearing schedule, that was okay. the date to identify. Leave, leave, leave it the way you have it, that's fine. The 20, so it's the 2nd and the 23rd of April. That's correct. Okay. In, that's it. In the 23rd is a regular meeting, and when, when is our other regular meeting? The 2nd of April. Oh, so it's going to be a combination. Combination budget hearing and regular meeting. Yeah, no, we've done that. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's the goal we tried to set out there. We, we so figured I, by dedicating three evening Monday, three evening hearings, we could spread. What was February dates? February in the February Saturday February meeting, we are going to do the three budgets, correct? That is the intention February at this dates? point, yes. Uh, the 12th <coughs> and the 26th. And we have the 5th and the 19th on March. The 5th and the 19th. Back to back, and, and then the second and the 23rd of April, yeah. and then and the third. Don't forget the third, right? Yep. Exactly, that's a Saturday budget here. Oh, yeah, the third, yeah, we've always had that. Okay, we're good. Thank All you. All right, I want to get us a quick update, or are you good? Uh, so, I have three items to speak to, and I apologize, I was not able to prepare a written report in time for the meeting packet. The first is an update relative to our snow and ice, no, snow and ice expenses for this um, current winter. Uh, right now we have uh, expended, um, we've, we've expended $55,874 beyond the approved $175,000 snow and ice budget. So we are in deficit. I have authorized deficit spending for purposes of snow and ice removal and um, soft sanding operations. So that $55,874 is something that we've accounted for in the so-called reserve in next year's budget, which amounts to $300,000. So we are approximately $56,000 into that $300,000 at this point in time. And so my understanding <coughs> was that uh, as a result of proposed um, state law changes by the governor, you approve now we don't the board doesn't vote on uh, that's correct yeah that's correct but in the interest of full transparency this is the first meeting we've had since we've identified the mm -hmm. formal uh, numbers and so i thought that it should be conveyed um secondly um just to update on the board um relative to some police um staffing we, we did have a resignation from the department back in november um and it was followed by the announcement of uh, long-term officer, Officer Jim McCormick's intention to retire from the police department. So we congratulate him on his service. Um, that creates two vacancies in the department and the chief has been working with the human resources director and his command staff evaluating candidates from the assessment center that we conducted back in May of last year. We have identified candidates. So ask the board members to be aware that we'll be contacting you relative to potential swearing in dates, I think in early February um, for these two candidates. <coughs> Um, again, just a further example of us working quickly within the uh, structure that the police department, um, that the police chief recommended and was negotiated with the union um, in negotiations two years ago. We're able to more uh, effectively and efficiently proceed with the hiring process. And I want to thank the uh, chief and his command staff for their efforts to work forward. And, and again, congratulate Officer McCormick on his retirement and his. When did he retire? What was his date? Uh, he has not retired. Oh. Intention to retire. Intention to retire. Okay. Yes. So, um, okay. I'm looking to see. I don't have the date right there, but I don't believe it has come yet. So, anything else? Um, yep. My final comment is relative to the position of fire chief. <coughs> Some um, folks in town were here this morning for the swearing in of uh, provisional fire chief Donald Stats uh, here at the town hall. Um, a little bit about the. Um, the process for those in the community who may not be aware. Uh, the position of fire chief in North Reading is a civil service position. That means we're required to follow a state mandated process to examine or assess uh, qualified candidates for permanent appointment. The town will be proceeding to secure the necessary approvals and agreements to conduct an assessment center, which we anticipate will be concluded between six and 12 months from now. In the interim, uh, provisional chief stats will be charged with leadership and oversight of the fire department. Mr. Stats was selected based on his combined education, experience, and leadership, as well as his insights to the operation of the department. I wish to thank the other candidates from within the department for this position. 
I had a difficult choice to make for multiple qualified candidates, and I was impressed with the qualifications and perspective of the candidates. Chief Stats <coughs> joined the North Threading Fire Department uh, as a firefighter EMT in 1998, was promoted to the office of captain in 2011, and uh, was appointed and sworn in as a fire chief this morning here in Town Hall. Prior to his time with the town of North Reading, he served in a variety of public safety capacities, including corrections officer, police and fire dispatcher, and border patrol agent for the U.S. Border Patrol. Um, I congratulate <coughs> Chief Stats, <coughs> excuse me, on assuming the role. Um, and uh, I also would reiterate and congratulate Chief Warnock uh, on his retirement, uh, his last uh, day uh, working for the town was Sunday. Um, and I know uh, some of the board members were able to attend a, a very nice send-off for him at the fire department on Friday, put together by uh, the men of the fire department. And so again, congratulations to Chief Stats and congratulations to Chief Warnock. And that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, good. Just echo good congratulations to Chief Warnock again uh, on his retirement and uh, thank him for his lengthy service to the community and stewardship of the fire department. Uh, he did a terrific job and wish him a long, healthy, and happy retirement. And to uh, Provisional Chief Stats, uh, I just want to offer him congratulations. Uh, congratulations to his proud mother and father also. And it was uh, great to be here this morning and watch his uh, mother swear him in. That was, that was an additional treat. And um, just uh, offer my support in his uh, his new endeavor and his new new challenges ahead of him. And I, uh, That's all. I, <coughs> okay. Is that turn? Yep. Okay. I, I thank uh, Bill Warnock uh, on Friday for his services and thank him as a, as a friend and individual that, uh, you know, did a great job while he was here. And uh, although he didn't get to the swearing in because a customer called me early this morning with a crisis, but I did get back in time to uh, shake his hand. <laughs> and, uh, welcome him as our interim chief and I uh, look forward to uh, and we should all be look forward to working with the interim chief as we go through the process spelled out under civil service to appoint a new chief that's all I do Michael yeah just to not to be a parrot here but I had a chance to go to Chief Warnock's retirement party on Friday and the uh, I want to thank the rank and file for putting together a great reception for him and uh, wish the chief well in his retirement and wish uh, our new provisional chief stats nothing but the best. Same. Uh, I guess same is what I want to say. Same. Congratulations to Chief Warnick. I wish him lots of fun and happiness and whatever he decides to do next. He's a pretty young guy. And thank him for his years of dedicated service and good luck to Chief Stats. Same here. Uh, I'll echo all that, but I also want to point out to the town administrator and especially our HR director. You guys worked uh, overtime over the weekend to really get this pulled off by this morning. So thank you for all of your extra efforts. I know you guys are even attending the MMA conference, which we'll hear about the next meeting. <laughs> and um, but I know you guys were pulling some uh, OT over the weekend. We much appreciated getting it all done. So thank you for that, and we look forward to uh, seeing. Uh, Chief Stats uh, flourish in his role. And uh, with that, I'll take our motion to adjourn. I will give you a motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.